Hello everybody, it's James Lindsay. You're listening to the New Discourses podcast. Now, here on the podcast, usually I have some enthusiasm to communicate to you what I'm going to communicate to you, but that's not always the case, and today is one of those times. I am coming to you lamenting that I have to do this podcast. There are some of these episodes that I truly lament, not just the doing but having to do them. And this is one I truly lament having to talk about this at all, as often seems to be the case. So you will recall two podcasts I want to bring to your recollection in the New Discourses podcast library. It is not necessary that you listen to these to follow this one. It is advisable that you perhaps dip into one of the two so you understand the context a little better, and the other you don't really need. At least you don't need to listen to it to get what you're going to get out of this, because I'm going to riff. So the one that you don't need to go listen to, though I encourage you for other reasons, is a podcast I did a while back titled WTF is SEL, which is short for what the F is social emotional learning. And I went into the occult roots of social emotional learning, but what the title reflected was the idea that um, there's this darker underbelly that just makes a normal person look at it and say, WTF is this? What the is this? And so, unfortunately, I'm going to have to do another WTF episode today. Um, The other is Two Wolves of Christian Nationalism. The Two Wolves of Christian Nationalism, in which I talked about two characters, William Wolfe and Stephen Wolfe, who are of no relation, who are both promoting different conceptions of a um, reactionary Christian, largely Protestant, but not wholly Protestant movement called Christian Nationalism, which I have characterized as, at best, a trap, Um, though I tried to deal with it somewhat on its own terms. I didn't give it probably the detail it deserves. You may want to listen to that one for context as to what this Christian nationalist thing is, because I'm not really going to get into that really deeply, even though the title of this podcast, which of course, if you clicked on it, you already know, is what the fuck is Christian nationalism? WTF is Christian nationalism. I mean, seriously, we're about to hear some properly crazy shit again, which I didn't want to have to deal with. And you don't want to have to deal with, but here we are having to deal with it. Now, this unfortunately is going to require me to do something that I've heard is one of my both finer and less appreciated traits. I'm going to have to use a lot of names. I'm going to have to tell people who is involved in this to make any sense of this, because I have to link what I'm going to spend the bulk of time in this podcast talking about, which is a manifesto, to Christian nationalism, which is not immediately apparent. That requires me to talk about a network of people so that we understand this set of connections. Um, I think when we read the manifesto, you will come away agreeing with me that WTF is Christian nationalism is a good title for this particular podcast and phenomenon that it examines. So I want to introduce to you the peculiar character, not of a wolf, not Stephen, not um, William, but of Charles Haywood. Charles Haywood is a former shampoo manufacturer of great wealth from Indiana. Now, I remember talking with some people at some point in the movement, and I don't recall who they were, and I don't recall when it was some time ago, telling me there was a fairly wealthy conservative who had stumbled his way into producing black hair care products and becoming very rich, who was interested in getting involved. I don't remember the context of that conversation. I just thought it was really strange when I finally get Charles Haywood thrown in front of my experience because he decided to attack me on a Monday morning on Twitter, bizarrely, and then I find out he was on Tucker Carlson. See, I didn't want to draw any attention to this and was probably not even going to do this, but then I realized Tucker put him on his show, and I was like, well, if he's been on Tucker Carlson, he's definitely fair game. He's not. It's not like I'm going to bring him attention he wouldn't have got otherwise. But Tucker, I've heard, is, as they say, Schmidt-pilled now, which is a huge concern, very, very big concern, if true. That is a very bad thing, if true. 
and I will elaborate on Schmidt in a minute so we understand what schmidt pilled means. There's a lot going on here that you haven't been aware of in all likelihood. But I figured, okay, so here's this guy talking to Tucker, and then it's the same guy that attacked me on Twitter in a very arrogant and bizarre, <laughs> very bizarre way. Like, he's, like, telling me that I'm afraid of his power, and I'm not at all sure what that's talking about. And he just kept repeatedly calling me fat, which I'm sure he thinks triggers me. Um, I'm not particularly fat, so that's actually kind of funny. Um, whatever. But then there's a lot of things that are jumping to mind all at once that I have to say, but one of the things he said to Tucker at the beginning introducing himself to make sense of this is that he was a shampoo manufacturer, a hair care product manufacturer, who had stumbled one step after another into producing black hair care products. So I'm assuming it's the same guy as I had heard about a couple of years ago and put no time or effort or interest into whatsoever beyond that. Um, now, Haywood has been involved in whatever the hell he's doing now uh, since at least 2020 with verifiable receipts. Uh, that's not in question. That's not in doubt whatsoever. But many people got activated in 2020 when they saw the Cultural Revolution in America kick off. Um, so that's not terribly surprising. Now, I have to start connecting this, and I think the best way is to just start telling a story a little bit about this Monday morning. I'd just come back from this trip. Flights were messed up because that's just the way of American travel now, thanks to entities like the World Economic Forum, as you have heard or will hear, depending on the order these come out in my degrowth podcast. Uh, I got home at like three in the morning. I wake up. I'm not particularly happy about my previous day, which was really just this travel extraordinaire experience. Um, you know, Flight delayed, flight delayed, flight delayed, going to be a tight connection after a long layover. Now I'm not going to make it. Now, oh my gosh, we're not even going to go. Yes, now we are, but no, we're not. Never mind. It's going to get, in fact, the flight's going to get canceled. But meanwhile, the other flight got delayed, so I could make it still. But whoops, we're not going to go. But yep, now we're going to go. And so then we finally go. And then I was going to make it just barely. And I run to the gate and I just barely make it, only to find out there's no plane there. And it gets delayed another like two or three hours. And I don't get home till three in the morning wonderful travel experience Sunday, wake up Monday, and here's Charles Haywood saying that I predicted what would happen with pride completely wrong. Now, I've never heard of Charles Haywood. I don't know who he is. I don't care who he is. And I can't figure out why exactly he has decided to invest energy into saying that I'm a voice not to be listened to because I said that there would be an escalating provocation leading up to and through pride that... Um, very well could trigger a reaction in conservative Christianity, and I was trying to warn conservative Christians in May that this was something to be paying attention to. Now, of course, I think a lot of this got derailed because of the trans shooter in Nashville, and a lot of things got changed, and I think my warning did successfully reach a lot of ears, which may have helped. I started saying the drag Floyd thing, so speaking into that in a powerful way in December the previous year, I was in the presence of Tim Poole, who has, to my knowledge, not mentioned it again, Steve Bannon, who I don't know if he's talked about it again, uh, and Charlie Kirk, who I know has talked about it many times to his very large, very active audience, and I also spoke on the radio to Glenn Beck, who uh, also agreed with me that this was something of some concern that Christian conservatives should not take the bait during any escalating provocations in pride. Now, why would I think they're escalating provocations besides using my eyes? Well, it's literally, if we go to Beautiful Trouble, which is the updated version for the modern era of Saul Alinsky's Rules for Radicals, which is published for free at beautifultrouble.org, if we go there, we can see escalating provocations is literally one of their tactics so that it can link directly to another one of their tactics or actually a principle, which is your enemies or your targets reaction is your main action, which is derived directly from Saul Alinsky's Rules for Radicals, uh, where he used the word enemy, although they use the word target in beautiful trouble. And so I read the tea leaves. I said they're obviously trying to provoke Christian conservatives. The Christian nationalism movement was on a fevered pitch at that time to point out the horrors and evils of everything LGBTQ, 
um, including just basic homosexuality, not even this whole queer lobby and queer agenda. I was being attacked viciously and vigorously for trying to separate the TQ from the LGB. They've labeled me a, quote, known homosexual, despite the fact that I've been happily married to a woman for getting on 20 years now. Um, and that's not like a front, as it turns out. Um, they were saying that this proves that I am actually woke, that the Christian nationalists being the theys. Whether Charles Haywood got involved in this then or not, I don't know, because he was a completely irrelevant clown uh, that I had paid no attention to up until Monday. Uh, this particular Monday, which at the time when this comes out will be at least a couple of weeks ago. And so he throws out this attack that I was completely wrong. I shouldn't be listened to. I'm a fraud, blah, blah, blah. I'm histrionic. I'm waving my hands in the air. And then Stephen Wolf, within about an hour, repeated the exact same attack, which caught my attention because Stephen and I don't exactly have a positive working relationship after the little podcast before anyway. And talking about his book a lot, which literally says that people like me will be driven out of society near the end, so I'm not particularly peach keen on Mr. Wolf's Christian Prince-driven Christian nationalist project, which has stirred up a lot of debate. That book, by the way, was published by Canon Press, since we're naming names, which means Doug Wilson is involved. He is a um, particularly interesting Protestant pastor, I guess, is a way. I guess he's been kicked out of a lot of different churches uh, on heresy or whatever. So I hear, I don't know if that's true. I don't keep up with the politics in Narnia. Um, but he is holed up in Moscow, Idaho, of all places, Moscow, Idaho, and runs kind of his own thing out there. He's got a uh, blog and mablog or something like that, podcast, or maybe that's not what it's called. I don't know. It's a sign in the back. He talks about crap. Um, He's associated with whatever's going on in this Moscow, Idaho. And I only bring that up because we're about to hear more about Moscow, Idaho. What a shock. But he also published the book by Stephen Wolf, The Case for Christian Nationalism, through his publishing house, Canon Press. Well, I don't know that he specifically did it, but Canon Press did. And then Canon Press decided that taking pictures of me off of the internet and editing them so that my t shirt or whatever I'm holding advertises Stephen Wolf's book, The Case for Christian Nationalism, would be a fun bit of trolling to sell books, which I'm sure it did in their little target audience because I'm the biggest thing in their entire freaking world, which is pretty sad uh, as, because as Doug Wilson has pointed out, I'm just some guy, which is completely true. But what does that have to do with Haywood? Well, I have no direct connections between Stephen Wolf and um, Charles Haywood, except that they like each other's stuff on Twitter kind of a lot. Um, fine, whatever. Uh, William Wolf is also in the category of people who do the same thing. They all seem to attack me on similar days, uh, along with another character who, if you go after Charles Haywood, will probably pop up in your life. If you go on social media, his name is Nate Fisher. I met Nate Fisher a couple of years ago in January of 21 at a conference. I talked to Nate Fisher again when I was invited by his business partner, Matthew Peterson, who I've always had a positive relationship with, um, who is now also editor-in-chief of The Blaze. Um, but I was invited by Matt Peterson to come check out their offices at the American Reformer and New Founding right before they technically launched. So I visited. That's all in the interest of full disclosure, but where it's also in the interest of laying down names that are all going to be relevant to what's going on to connect this to Christian nationalism. Because Doug Wilson and Nate Fisher are some of the biggest pushers of Christian nationalism. And under Matt Peterson, the Schmittian politics that I mentioned that they said connect to both Haywood and to um, Tucker Carlson, whether that's true or not, are certainly being platformed by The Blaze. Another character, C.J. Engels, bragged that they had Tucker Carlson speaking in Idaho or in Iowa. Uh, lots of I states get confusing. Turns out Haywood's from Indiana, another I state, which is just a coincidence. Um, when Tucker Carlson did this big political thing in Iowa a few months ago, The Blaze covered it. Peterson was there. And C.J. Engels, who I have no freaking idea who he is, except that he's a thorn in my side on Twitter to some degree because he's a putz, uh, bragged openly that sh that uh, Schmidians were the ones that were leading the commentary from the blaze covering that event. 
in particular having a lot to do with Mr. Ron DeSantis, because that event was happening during the turning point action that Ron DeSantis did not attend, um, but Donald Trump did. So lots of little political things going on behind the scenes. And I know I've taken a long time to kind of not introduce what is really going on. So who's Charles Haywood? He's connected to all of these people. Well, Charles Haywood isn't just a shampoo, black hair care products guy. If you give a crap at all, he's not a black guy. That doesn't matter one bit as to whether or not he knows how to make formulas for black hair care. Um, so it turns out that Charles Haywood kind of runs two operations on the internet. One of these operations is called the Worthy House. And that's what he talked about in very circumspect terms with Tucker Carlson. The Worthy House, which says, Toward a politics of future past, as its tagline, which he has unpacked here and there, in particular to Tucker Carlson, meaning that we're going to go into a new future, but we're going to kind of have um, values like the past. Now, we can't go back to the past is his main point. So it's, it's a politics of future past, which you will immediately recognize as postmodern gobbledygook. Now, I would distinguish this from leftist postmodernism, and there is a rightist version of postmodernism, right-wingers who are going post-liberal and have adopted the idea that it is time, they don't call themselves postmodern, despite the fact that they want to move beyond the modern world and keep some of its better pieces, which is what post means. They call themselves post-liberal, but the liberal or order in the West is what defines the modern world. So they are postmodern as well. And politics of future past is a postmodern concept. Now, the way we would distinguish left and right postmodernism in particular, we would say, of course, that the left is very transgressive, blah, blah, blah. And the right is, as I've put them in the past, pomo trad. They're postmodern traditionalists. They carry a uh, traditional values in pastiche uh, and pretend as images, as emblems that they hold up and that they uh, locally imbue with meaning that are not necessarily uni universally meaningful, whatever you want to say. What I would actually put it kind of in a more abstract but comprehensible sense, riffing off of Zygmunt Bauman, who is a kind of Marxist philosopher who claims that postmodernism is not moder postmodernism at all. It is what he calls liquid modernity. It is the same ethos. Let's say he would agree, by the way, Haywood and Bauman would agree that, that postmodernism and communism are extensions of the modern era and uh, logical conclusions of the modern era and the liberalism. Uh, so he call, Bauman calls this uh, liquid modernity. There's a book by that title, which is a interesting and kind of wanting to stab yourself in the eyes, painful read. But liquid modernity, so the idea with left postmodernism is it's liquefying everything. It's giving you no solid ground to stand on. Um, what you might say is uh, right-wing postmodernism is, is maybe a refactoring modernity. So their goal is to smash it into pit bits, not melt it into a liquid or dissolve it in the acid of deconstruction but to smash it into pieces, utterly obliterate it, crunch it up with big hammers, and then put the pieces back together with a kind of new uh, values-based, pastiche values-based glue, largely off of kind of muscular reinterpretations of Christian doctrine, uh, but not necessarily so. So the idea, sometimes you have these Bronze Age, age characters that want to look back to the Bronze Age or whatever and claim that. So the politics of future past, that's just straight up a postmodern sentiment, but I don't, I'm not accusing Charles Haywood, who seems to be an extremist right-wing nut job, of being a uh, postmodernist on the left. He is a postmodernist on the right. His goal is not to deconstruct and dissolve society. His goal is to fragment and refactor society, uh, as we will actually hear more clearly so I'm not putting words in his mouth, and basically to grind it into rubble and then put it back together as he would, which sounds very Fabian if you understand what's on the Fabian glass. And if you don't know what the Fabian window or Fabian glass is, you should look it up and find out all the evil things about George Bernard Shaw and all of that. But that's beside the point. It's funny, though, that the symbol of the Fabian society, which is on the glass, is a wolf in sheep's clothing, given the wolves of Christian nationalism and the fact that they seem to have infiltrated as wolves in sheep's clothing the blaze media. So Charles Haywood, if you go, calls himself maximum leader of the Worthy House of the magazine. 
this to give him all the credit that one possibly could. Uh, he does mention explicitly on Tucker Carlson, his episode with Tucker Carlson today. He also says, at least on Twitter, that it's a sort of self-effacing joke that in his previous jobs, he jokingly called himself Maximum Leader, and he's carried the title over. He does look in his picture like an affable guy. He seems in his interview with Tucker to be a fairly funny man, so I will give him credit that he calls himself Maximum Leader, not because he's the obvious cult leader that he is, but because he thinks it's funny, but that is consistent with the postmodernist part. I'm going to be a cult leader, but it's going to be an inside joke. Ha ha, if you join the cult for $10 or $50 or whatever a month, we'll tell you what it really means. He he he, Maximum Leader. So it shows a picture of him and says Maximum Leader above it in large font. It then says Charles Haywood is the Maximum Leader of the magazine, meaning the Worthy House, and the founder of the applied political philosophy of foundationalism, which is what we're going to be the manifesto about. He is a member of Generation X. Who fucking cares? His views are right-wing with a future-oriented post-liberal bent. He doesn't admit to the postmodernism. He probably doesn't recognize it. He does not belong to any existing political party. Like Miniver Chivi, he was born too late and wishes he could be a knight hospitaler or hospitaler or whatever, but with a railgun and a warp drive. That's a little concerning. He desires comity, but realizes, despite being a practicing and believing Christian, that ultimately no final question, final question, can be solved without conflict, usually involving violence. Thus, his style tends to be megalomaniacal and apocalyptic. He likes to fight. He also told Tucker on his show, though laughing, and it's the kind of joke I might make, that his favorite thing in the world to talk about is himself. Um, I make that as a self-effacing joke. I don't claim to be megalomaniacal. Megalono- Jeez, I've done it now. Megalomaniacal, however. What does Haywood want, he says, that is often asked. No, it's not. Nobody knows who you are. Um, part of the answer can be found on our about page, which explains that he uses the writing here at the Worthy House primarily to develop his own thoughts. To what end, though? As it has developed to the end of outlining and preparing for the advent of a political philosophy which he has named foundationalism and which he is preparing to implement in real life. If you are interested, though why you would be is unclear, see there's that self-effacing humor, In a personality profile of Charles, one can be found here, which I'm not even going to bother clicking on. He was, for six years, a mergers and acquisitions lawyer with law and business degrees from the University of Chicago and a clerkship for a Seventh Circuit judge. But despite this background, he is a class trader and regime enemy. For 15 years, he was the owner and operator of Mansfield King, one of the largest and most profitable manufacturers of hair and skin care products in North America, which he started by himself from nothing. He recently sold that business. Now he is rich beyond the dreams of avarice and looking to cause trouble. That's cutesy-ass code for brother writes checks. He has a political axe to grind. He has a political philosophy. You're going to hear that he's a psychopath, probably by listening to his ideas like this violent stuff. And I don't know that he's clinically a psychopath. Maybe I shouldn't say that. But he's clearly a bit of a nut job. And he is clearly... Uh, okay with this idea of violence, and he has this, and he's going to write checks. And I'm not going to go into um, where he says he can provide you with services. So that's Maximum Leader. That's Charles Haywood, how he describes himself on his own personal about page. But what about the about page for the Worthy House? What is the Worthy Worthy House? The Worthy House offers writings that revolve around moving toward a politics of future past. Okie dokie. In short, that means that most but not all writings are related in some way to reality-based human flourishing in the post-liberal future. Politics in this sense is thus viewed broadly and includes most of all history. The political sense of this magazine is encapsulated in the seven quotes at the very bottom of every page, together with the quote from T.E. Lawrence on the right side of the front page. The primary author and maximum leader is Charles. He uses the process of writing mainly to develop his own thoughts, battle preparation, If they are sometimes useful to others, so much the better. And there's kind of a lot, since this is really, really long, um, 
there's a lot about how he organizes this. It's not really necessary since it's going to be long to read his whole manifesto. I'm not going to go through it. I will point out that one of the things that he mentions when he talks to Tucker Carlson is that, and it is actually one of the bigger essay pieces here on The Worthy House, is that he went into a long, detailed exploration and explanation of the Spanish Civil War. What he doesn't bother to tell Tucker although it's very clear if you actually bother to read the essay, is that he's a gigantic fan of Francisco Franco. So if you like that style of politics, you might like Mr. Haywood if fascism is your flavor. Um, but uh, Franco is a colored character in history, and having an American Franco might not be the best plan in the world, even if Charles Haywood has lots of Aver wealth beyond avarice to write checks to implement that. But how on earth would he implement it? By hiring people to write for the Worthy House, right? Well, no, certainly not. He's got more. So on or Open Corporates, which is the open database of the corporate world, we can look up a thing called the Society for American Civic Renewal, Inc. The Society for American Civic Renewal, Incorporated. You can look it up yourself. You can see the status, the company number, incorporation date. I'm not going to read it all, but uh, the incorporation date was 22nd July, 2020. It was founded in Indiana. I won't read the address. It has three officers and directors. Um, recent filings, though, 27 July, 2022, five days after business entity report, 2020, uh, 22nd July, articles of incorporation, and guess who it's credited to on July 22nd, 2020? Edition of Officer Charles Haywood as the incorporator. So it was incorporated by Charles Haywood. So he has this thing called the Society for American Civic Renewal Incorporated. Now it turns out it has branch offices in Dallas, Texas, which is where Nate Fisher not only lives, but is the president of his branch. There is another in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. I'm not quite sure who is involved in that one. And there is another in Moscow, Idaho. Now, I'm not sure who's involved in that one either, but since Moscow, Idaho is roughly the size of a postage stamp and Doug Wilson's the biggest political player there, one might make guesses that, in fact, weirdly, some of the biggest players and biggest names in the Christian nationalist movement push are unambiguously affiliated with the Society for American Civic Renewal that was founded by Big Bucks with an axe to grind in a political philosophy he developed Charles Haywood, who's getting airtime on Tucker Carlson, among other places. Hmm, very suspicious. So what, uh, what is Christian nationalism? Well, let's look at the Society for American Renewal, American Civic Renewal, I, my bad. You go to their website, and there's this weird, weirdly designed circle spinning around the whole thing. Some people have suggested it reminds them of the Ouroboros, the snake eating its own tail. I don't necessarily see that immediately. I don't see a head on it or a tail, for example. Um, the designing could be similar to snake-ish things, but I'm not going to make any definitive claims on that. And then there's this weird symbol that looks like the weapon that Raphael from the Ninja Turtles held that was called, in, in Japanese, it's called a Sai. You might think it looks like a sword with a U-shaped guard. Um, and then it says, we seek a civilizational renaissance. So there's this weird symbol and then that. The vision, we foresee a nation building great projects of civic and cultural renaissance. So they're going to rebuild our society for us. Renewal, right? A society with a strong leadership, uh-oh, committed to family and culture. Society that nurtures rather than neglects virtue. A society that seeks the good and the beautiful and abjures ideology. It doesn't When you hear this, it's not going to sound like the ideology of foundationalism abjures ideology. I will remind Mr. Haywood and all of you listening that Karl Marx also said that Marxism was the one final solution to get rid of ideology. His was alone the philosophy in the world that did not present an ideology. It says we are raising accountable leaders to help build thriving communities of free citizens who will reclaim a human vision of society while rebuilding the frontier conquering spirit of America. I don't know what frontier they think they're going to conquer, except that it's space, because that's what's in Charles's manifesto, which otherwise isn't referenced here at all. A new thing for a new day. You know, like, you know, 
the politics of future past, informed by the wisdom of the past, but facing the future. Oh, it is the politics of future past. It just doesn't use those words. So Haywood is definitely uh, the philosophical uh, driver behind some of this, along with Carl Schmitt. So we will pause for some Carl Schmitt here because Carl Schmitt's a name that's not particularly well known. But we see this uh, thing that I said, uh-oh, too, which is that they are wanting a society with strong leadership. So Carl Schmitt had kind of two really big ideas. Who was he, though? He was eventually the crown jurist of the Third Reich. I did not mispronounce that. He was Adolf Hitler's crown jurist um, in Nazi Germany in the 1930s and 1940s. Now, whether he was a committed Nazi or not is an open question. I've heard that he did and heard that he did not, and I don't know which is correct, and I'm not interested enough to dig into it to find out if he renounced Nazism after Hitler died and the Nazi regime fell in 1945. Uh, However, before the Nazis took power in 1933, he was certainly not a Nazi. He, in fact, was working very vigorously to warn von Hindenburg that the Nazis and the communists presented two huge threats to the uh, Germans, and that what what von Hindenburg needed to do was to seize unbridled executive power. An unbound executive is one of his concepts, strong leadership, in other words. Not electing servants who are public servants who serve with extremely limited um, powers and checks and balances and so on at the with the consent of the governed, but rather an unbound executive. One of the things that Carl Schmitt laid out is a p- theory of political sovereignty, that a sovereign is defined by being able to be exempt from his own rules and laws. Your sovereignty means that you're not bound by anything, so you can go above the rules and the laws. And so the sovereign is defined as the person who is empowered to be unbound by the law. So checks and balances be damned. So that's strong leadership. So that's already concerning because we don't really want a American dictator like a, an American Franco, although they do. Um, that's a problem. In fact, they argue on Twitter sometimes, as Mr. Haywood did today as of this recording, that um, sometimes a dictator is not really that bad. You know, some dictators are good, some dictators are bad, blah, blah, blah. And they keep referencing back to Caesar and they do actually do a lot of kind of Caesarism and hail Caesar this and hail Caesar that in the little club. You know, these people are kind of behind this. But anyway, that's one of Carl Schmitt's big ideas. The other of Carl Schmitt's big political ideas, I didn't finish the story about what happened. So Hitler took the chancellorship because von Hindenburg did not seize unbound executive power and smash the Nazis and the communists, not necessarily knowing whether or not that would work or what it would create if he did. But anyway, Hitler gets the chancellorship. Within a few weeks, Carl Schmitt joins the Nazis, rises very quickly to become a chief political philosopher and uh, and um, crown jurist for Hitler's Nazi party uh, as it ran Germany uh, rather famously, rather badly. And so although people would argue who are fans, and it turns out those people exist and maybe on the rise again, unfortunately, um, that it was a very efficient system. In fact, I've heard that from people who are running the kind of World Economic Forum sort of universe, that it was a very efficient system, but it got some things wrong, um, like the violence in particular. And so (laughs) that's uncomfortable. I don't know why we'd want to go that way. But in 1932, right before Hitler took the chancellorship, which was in 33, if you know your history, Carl Schmitt published a book called, uh, crap, what is it? The Nature of the Political, something of the political. Something of the political. It'll come back to me. I should have it in front of me, but I've read most of it. It's not a particularly unpleasant or difficult read. It's not a particular, it's political philosophy. It sort of sucks. Uh, But what he lays out in that book is this idea called the friend-enemy distinction. He, in fact, says that the essence of politics is the friend-enemy distinction. Uh, The meaning when I say the essence of politics, it means if you were to take away the take the moral realm and say what qualifies the moral or ethical realm and lay out moral and ethical as a kind of a realm of thought, it would have certain guidelines. And that's completely distinct from another realm that might be the physical, which is completely distinct from another realm that might be called the political. So what characterizes the political realm itself? And he says it is the distinction between friend and enemy. So friends are people that you are in league with and enemies are people that you are against. 
your coalition versus their coalitions. Friends are in coalition together at the extremes of enmity that he says is the characterizing feature of the friend-enemy distinction is that friends and enemies have mutual enmity toward one another. Uh, you will die for the people on your side and your friends, and you will kill people in the enemy group, your enemies. And both sides feel this way, and that actually defines the political. Now, he laments that this is how the political is defined. He wishes it were some other way, but he says at the end of the day, that's what the political always is. So it's always a conflict between our team versus their team. In other words, it is a social identity nightmare at bottom. Not something that can be provoked into that terrific ground state, and I mean terrific as in terrifying, but rather something that is essentially characterized as being in that base ground state. And I would disagree with that definition of the political, and I think many other people would. I think that liberalism, which the people who are involved in this seem not to understand at all, is a political philosophy designed entirely around creating a conflict resolution schema that sidesteps all of the friend-enemy conflict. Now, Schmidt recognizes this and gives a critique of liberalism that sounds almost identical to the critique of liberalism in many ways that Mao gave in 1937, a few years later in China. And that critique of liberalism given by Schmidt uh, is that liberalism tries to take the political, meaning the friend-enemy distinction, out of politics entirely and is therefore doomed to fail because it refuses to recognize friends and enemies as the essence of politics. It sets itself up to lose and only lose at politics because it's trying to do the impossible, which is to take the what makes politics truly political out of politics entirely, which is obviously impossible. And so that's his basis for his critique of liberalism, and that's what uh, he would say is why the tolerance at the root of liberal society and its conflict resolution schema is a failing game from the get-go. And if you listen to some of these characters that are Schmidians, like Aaron McIntyre, who's now working for The Blaze, who used to just be some dipshit on Twitter, um, and with a podcast that nobody listened to, that you can hear them describe Carl Schmidt in this way as well. You will hear this kind of Schmidtian view. So when they say that Tucker Carlson is Schmidt-pilled, which is an open question in my book, that's a cause for concern because it's unbound executives using power to define a friend-enemy distinction and start smashing our enemies and stand up for our friends, which includes one of Charles Haywood's favorite things to say, which I would say all the time if I was him and had stupid beliefs like his, no enemies to the right which has got him excoriated even by pretty hardcore downers like Rod Dreher, who wrote um, that Charles Haywood is a complete nut job, as in literally, quote, batshit crazy uh, for his positions. And again, the same idea of no enemies to the right, which it explains why there's this absolute tolerance within his, I'll say, cult um, for characters like Andrew Torba, who not only signal uh, their willingness to to tolerate outright anti-Semitism and other things, but uh, also keep a toe firmly across the line, uh, signaling that they may well agree with it. And um, they are provocateurs who bring this into society. Andrew Torba, for whatever it's worth, is the CEO of the social media platform Gab. But he, along with another character named Andrew Isker, is the author of another book about Christian nationalism that lays out uh, a case for the uh, phenomenon before that was written down by um, Stephen Wolf in his book, The Case for Christian Nationalism. So Christian nationalism is sort of inextricable from all of this. Now, how does this cult, I mean, what is it called? Society, secret society, or semi-secret society, actually, for American civic renewal. How does it work with this weird symbol in its vision? It said it is, a bro it is a brotherhood of faith and solidarity. The past is sealed, they say. The future is open. As the great men of the West bequeathed their deeds to us, so must we leave a legacy for our children. Through association bound by a common vision, we strengthen the ties that bind us together. You know, like the ropes or the strings that you would use to bind together a bundle of sticks, which in Italian is pronounced fascio, which is the root word for fascism. 
Uh, We strengthen the ties that bind us together as Americans and as free men. The works raised by our funds to this end will last long after we are buried. Oh, sorry, it doesn't say funds, it says hands. It's red print on yellow, and I've had a long day of actually doing things out in the world, so I'm a little blind. The works raised by our hands to this end will last long after we are buried. It has civilizational achievement as its shared goal, in case you wonder what that bound together shared vision is. A man is no longer to be, in, or sorry, a man is no longer encouraged to fly to the stars. There's, we're going to hear uh, Haywood's ideas of space, to tame the wilderness, to plant the seeds that his children will inherit. Rather, those who rule today spit on such ambitions, they corrupt the sinews of America. They have alienated men from family, community, and God. We counter and conquer this poison, rebuilding a society where a man can find genuine fulfillment, true to his nature and calling, rejoicing in virtue and vitality. Now that actually largely sounds accurate, despite the quite pugnacious language. Remember, Charles likes to fight. Um, Except that when we read the manifesto, you're going to see that it's actually kind of fucked up what he has in mind for that. The next section, though, is that symbol, the weird Ouroboros, maybe not circle with the um, mark. It's called the mark. It's called the mark. Now, if I was a postmodern person, I would think calling it the mark, while looking very much like an antichrist organization, would be really funny. But it's that weird um, thing that looks kind of like a sword or the Japanese sai uh, in the middle of this circle that people immediately seem to think looks like an Ouroboros. It says the mark and its seal evoke the goals of the society and signify what binds the members of the society. Christianity. The mark evokes two versions of the cross used in early Christianity, St. Peter's cross and the anchor cross. So you could say it looks a bit like an anchor and some people on the internet saw it and have. St. Peter's cross is the inverted cross, which is Yes, used as a symbol of humility in the context of the St. Peter's Cross, but it is also associated with the Antichrist. The former is a symbol of faithful humility, that's St. Peter's Cross. The idea is that it's upside down because St. Peter refused to uh, accept the same station as his uh, Lord, and so asked to be crucified on a cross upside down. So it is a symbol of faithful humility, the ladder of stability, that's the anchor cross, a ladder of stability and hope, both within a Trinitarian framework and rejecting modernist philosophies and heresies. I like that they point out explicitly the Trinitarian framework because they quote John Adams all the time. Our constitution was written for a moral and religious people and is wholly inadequate to the governance of any other, which, be that as it may, maybe it's well and good, maybe it's completely true, but John Adams was a Unitarian who rejected the Trinity and the divinity of Christ and would not be welcome in their Christian nationalist program. So that's interesting. You know, you can use the character as you will, though, because it's just about the, the means justifying the ends. So it also, the mark, the mark, the mark, emblemizes authority and the exercise of power. You could also say that it's like a big horn sticking out of a little ri- ring of horns or something. It's not really. I'm just trying to do a Book of Daniel thing awkwardly. That's probably not fair. Authority and the exercise of power. The mark is both sword and shield. The first, the traditional symbol of temporal authority. The second, a symbol of defense of the weak, the widow, and the orphan. And all of those under sustained attack by the powers of the current age. Why they can't just say, there is a communist provocation on the West and the world, and we want to fight it, I don't know. There has to be something much broader, and we'll hear what that is shortly. Third, Renaissance. The mark looks backward, but it also looks forward and upward. That's an interesting thing. So does it have three faces? A new America for a new age informed by the wisdom of the old. The future is renaissance. The goal of the society is renewal, returning to success, heedless of nostalgia. The mark, which is, by the way, a big point that um, Haywood raises a lot in his discussion with Tucker Carlson, which was from last September 22, uh, if you wonder when that conversation took place, um, 
It's funny, in that conversation, I don't know why this just jumped to mind, he talks about how he had extra screening because he was flying into Washington, D.C., so obviously that there's some extra screening going on if you're going to go to the nation's capital. And that, of course, is I fly to D.C. all the freaking time. That is laughable. The dude probably had like something in his luggage that triggered the thing. Happened sometimes with my garment steamer. Has happened before because I had candy bars in my bag. Sometimes they search your bag, Charles. It doesn't mean that you were going to D.C. and there's extra scrutiny. I fly to D.C. or through D.C., especially Dulles, which is the airport you named, all the time. I probably go through Dulles like several, four, five, six times a month, almost every month. I never have had additional weirdo screening because I went through Dulles. In other words, your interpretive frame is a little bit on the histrionic side, buddy. Uh, you're not, people are not out to get you and the, the Dulles airport as a layover spot is not significant enough to warrant them searching your bag. You just had something in it. Their scanner couldn't pick up. You're not special. Calm your ass down. The Mark looks back. Oh wait, we already said that part. Uh, <laughs> Uh, where, where were we? Heedless of nostalgia. That's right. Because he's he says we can't look backwards in nostalgia and try to rebuild the, the society of the past. We have to go to the future past instead. The mark, he says, shows a supported reaching for the sky, demanding of us that we excel in the works of man under the eyes of God. Then he says a word on joining the effort, membership in the society, which is organized primarily around local groups overseen by a national superstructure, is by invitation only. If you are interested in learning more, and they give you an email address. So that's the Society for Civic Renewal, which has lodges, as they call them, in Moscow, Idaho, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, Indianapolis, Indiana, where Charles Haywood incorporated it, and Dallas, where Nate Fisher, one of the biggest pushers of, of the Christian nationalist movement, a major player in American Reformer, uh, and uh, New Founding, also Align, and whatever the hell the other project is that the Blaze just bought. He was business partnered with Josh, Josh Abatoy, and more importantly, Matt Peterson, who got hired as the editor-in-chief at the Blaze recently. So we can see some entryist activity going into the Blaze. These Schmidians, who are in cahoots with this strange Haywood character, are members of this secret society, or at least some of them are. I don't know how many. But now all of a sudden we have this new dimension to what the hell F, what the F is Christian nationalism, is that there is a explicit secret society run by an apocalyptic megalomaniacal weirdo with lots and lots and lots of money behind it that starts explaining how in the world all these people you never heard of started making really big moves, really big splashes, really big changes in a lot of ministries that P.S. they will deny this, but... <clears throat> People talk, people know that they offered people lots of quote-unquote incentives, as Nate Fisher and Josh Abatoy put it in a podcast with Aaron Wren, that there would be lots of incentives for ministries and for other organizations to get in involved with them, which happened to be often to the tunes of many millions of dollars. Now, to do that, of course, you might need a donor who is richer than avarice, like Charles Haywood writing the checks. So now... Christian nationalism looking a lot less organic. It's looking like it is a deliberate move being facilitated not just through chat groups and Signal and Twitter and other places, but facilitated through the binding promises of a secret society, which is how everything works. That's how Gnosticism works. The secret of secret societies, by the way, is corruption. You scratch my back, I scratch yours. You're in this weird cult. Nobody would want to find out that you're in a cult. So if we all do what we have with our shared vision that we're bound to, like fascist sticks, bound together so that we're stronger together than one apart, which is literally the mentality of fascism, then uh, we won't have to tell anybody that you're in a weirdo secret society, which is being bankrolled by somebody richer than avarice who has written a manifesto for the Worthy House that seems to resonate strongly with what I just read from the secret society that he incorporated. So this, by the way, is the way all big things in the world actually work. It comes down to secret societies, the way that you get people. Why? Because the people in secret societies pull favors for other people in secret societies. So if you want to get a permit to build a thing that takes a bunch of paperwork, and if you have a guy that works at City Hall in your secret society, he stamps it for you. You don't have to go through all the regular processes. And if your enemies or people you don't like want to get it through, well, their paperwork just keeps getting lost. It keeps getting set to the bottom. It takes forever. It's really difficult. It's like um, social bribery. Um, you don't have to bribe anybody at all. 
you just do favors for each other. And then you have meetings and you have your shared vision and you make sure all the favors point in the direction of the shared vision. In other words, it is literally a system of corruption. It's literally the system in systemic racism that the woke would be pointing to, except that they're lunatics and think the whole society is participating in it and not just smaller groups. And so the World Economic Forum, in a sense, operates a secret society, the Davos Society with its Davos Manifesto. And it moves a lot of balls, doesn't it? Um, there are other secret societies. Um, it's sometimes dangerous to name them. So here we have a secret society. Uh, usually there's some kind of compromising. Uh, it depends on the level, like Freemasonry. That's a very famous secret society. The lower levels, you don't learn very much important stuff. You start doing lots of favors for people. You make sure things get done. You make blah, blah, blah. You don't learn really any secrets. It's not that compromising. You've just joined the thing and you see if you can keep a secret. But when you get to the higher levels, you have to go through rituals and rites. What happens in those is anybody's guess. I'm not going to make any claims about what happens in the Freemason ones. But I will make a guess that in the ones that really, really, really run society, I have a feeling a trip to an island's involved. Now, that is probably not the case for this dorky little thing going on uh, at the Society for American Civic Renewal under um, Mr. Haywood, which I don't know what's going on there because it's a secret society. It's invitation only. They're sure as hell not going to invite me. And if they do, I sure as hell am not going to go. So I don't know. But let's find out what his philosophy of foundationalism is that guides his thoughts, the Worthy House, and presumably the secret society of the Society for American Civic Renewal, and presumably, therefore, much of the inorganic part of, in other words, the driver's seat part of the Christian nationalist movement. Actually, let me pause before I do that, because I want to explain why Christian nationalism is happening at all. It's a trap. I think it's very clear that it's a trap. The left, of course, is seizing on the language. They've been using it for a long time. But uh, it was submitted to the House Unselect Committee on January 6th at the Capitol uh, by a lawyer named Andrew Seidel in 2021, whenever, two, when was that, whenever that, that was done. A 56-page dossier that I have and have read, I've read parts of publicly, that the actual cause of January 6th was, in fact, Christian nationalism. You see, there were many different groups there, MAGA this, something that, the other thing, this and that, and they are not all bound together by any one guiding philosophy except, argues Andrew Seidel, Christian nationalism. And they go into a large amount of time and effort explaining him. Eric Metaxas, for example, who's sort of a religious philosopher, I think, is a good way to put him. He has a very interesting show. He's written some very interesting books, Letter to the American Church, for example, Bonhoeffer. Um, so Eric Metaxas is given more than a full page of treatment as a paradigm example of a Christian nationalist. They give lots and lots of treatment to uh, things that happened at the Capitol, prayers that were said, the cross that was erected, people carrying the Confederate flag along with carrying a Christian flag to allege that those things are connected, um, which we will find when you pay, if you pay too much attention to some of the people involved in some of this Christian nationalist movement, you're going to find out that they are neo-Confederates. And so that's going to be able to reify really easy in a narrative arc because the examples to make evidence out of it are there. Um, but you can see what this is about. And what Andrew Seidel's punchline is, is that we have to start regulating elected officials such as Marjorie Taylor Greene and other Republicans who have come out and said that they, Marjorie came out and said she's a Christian nationalist, kind of like a fool, uh, supposing that's all she is. Um, but uh, other people have espoused what they hold up as Christian nationalist views, which might be as benign as saying that you are a Christian who loves your country or giving a prayer such as, um, you know, Lord bless this nation in Jesus name. Amen. That something as complicated as that could get you labeled a Christian nationalist. So the first thing he calls for is regulation of elected officials and such that they are not able to be professing Christians as openly and boldly. So that's going to be persecutorial. And the second thing that is recommended is that we understand that the true cause of January 6th was Christian nationalism, that the United States and Christian nationalism cannot coexist. One must destroy the other. That sounds pretty bad. And then um, finally, 
that if we don't start figuring out the role that Christian nationalism plays and where it comes from, if we don't start investigating from the federal government Christian nationalism with the full weight of the Department of Justice, full weight of the Department of Homeland Security behind it, maybe uh, law enforcement agencies like the FBI and so on, which we know what they'll do, um, then we can be assured that there will be another attack on our nation that's bigger and even more successful than January 6th was. So we have every reason to believe that this Christian nationalist push is in fact designed to be a trap, at least from the federal government side. Does Mr. Haywood know that? I don't know. Does Mr. Torba know that? I don't know. Does Mr. Wolf know that? Either one of them? I don't know. Um, do any of these other players know that? I don't know. Do they care? I don't know. I'm not alleging that anybody in particular is a Fed, but I have some serious suspicions among certain among this crowd. Now, now we can turn to Mr. Haywood and his uh, manifesto, um, reminding you that on Twitter he said, I fear his power. So this is an expression of his power in political philosophy, which is apparently what I fear. Um, remember, there will be no punching rights, so we're not going to criticize this whatsoever because we have a friend-enemy distinction to uphold because ultimately this is Schmidian, um, in addition to other things. So the foundationalist, man foundationalist manifesto, I'm not going to harp on the fact that foundationalism is already a thing, and so this is either ignorance or absolute hubris that he would claim that word, but I'm not, I'm not going to get into that or the distinction. The foundationalist manifesto, the politics of future past. That's literally the freaking title of this thing, the politics of future past, published on June 17th, 2021. Now, normally I wouldn't say a damn thing about when something happened to be published, except we have that number 17 appearing here, don't we? And so doesn't that come up a lot? There's this weird sun with a uh, red kind of at the middle when it's yellow in the middle and goes out to a red ball and then there's these spikes there's eight spikes with an eight rays in between each of the rays um i don't know what that emblemizes but it's at the top of his manifesto page it's this weird starburst sunshine looking thing and here's how he begins his manifesto charles haywood and i quote i am here to give you back your future <laughs> that's bold like Yeats's golden bird, I will tell you of what is past and passing and to come. He's a visionary guy. Who's Yeats? I'll go back and reread this entire crackpot paragraph in a second. Or Sorry, not who's Yeats, William Butler, Butler Yeats. He's a poet. We all know who he is. What is his golden bird? Well, that's from his poem Byzantium, which Josh Abatoy has his handle on Twitter is like B-Y-Z-N-E-S, business referencing Byzantium. Interesting. So the golden bird in Byzantium is something that's supposed to stand for human ingenuity, transcendence of the human spirit, blah, blah, blah. It's this character, and the poem's speaker is praising the bird and its ability to outperform all other birds, whether from hell or the everyday world. Um, and it's supposedly able to withstand flames, it's artificial creations with divine essence and all of this, and it's probably a phoenix, but Yeats's golden bird is this idea of death, birth, renewal, power, human spirit, triumphant, blah, 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 blah. And it references the poem Byzantium and everything that might come with that. Now, in the world of secret societies and manifestos and so on, this is what you call a key. The critical theorists usually have the fucking sense to put the key at the end, not at the beginning, so that people don't know what you're actually doing. But we're dealing with right-wingers who are literally, unfortunately, at least one notch less smart. You'll notice that they're a lot more obvious in just about everything they do. They're much easier to trigger, as it turns out, as well. They're super easy to bait, which is why they are the perfect foil to a left that understands that your target's reaction is your real action, like getting them to build something like this. So Yeats's Golden Bird is this phoenix. Um, this is a cipher. It refers to the poem Byzantium, and so something to do with that should frame all of your thoughts about all of this. This is your idea of future past. I am here to give you back your future. Like Yeats's golden bird, I will tell you of what is past and passing and to come. Thank you, shampoo god, maximum leader. Here I offer an exposition of my and what should be our political program, both philosophy and movement, foundationalism. Well, no. 
What is foundationalism? Foundationalism is a reflection of reality. So you remember when Hegel said that his whole philosophy was a speculative philosophy and everybody laughed because when I said in the podcast that speculative means speculum, speculum in Latin, which means mirror. In other words, that you're reflecting the world in theory, you're reflecting the forms, and then you're going to understand the world. So Hegel's frenumft, his understanding, is going to become the mirror by which you're going to reflect all of your experience and your theory and your praxis so that you can refine it to a better level. Okay, foundationalism is a reflection of reality, and through recognizing reality, it aims to maximize the chances of both individual and collective flourishing. It is a way forward, not a way back. Now, I would say that recognizing reality and adhering to reality, in fact, humbling yourself before reality, uh, which is, I think, a very biblical thing to do, um, is, in fact, uh, a good thing. The question is, are we doing that by putting our foundationalism first, or are we according our foundationalism to reality? In which case, we don't need it because it's already called science. Um, the liberalism that he's about to lay on the altar and sacrifice to pieces is, in fact, the way that you do that without putting ideology first. There's, you're going to feel some Hegel and some Marx all throughout this. The 12 pillars of foundationalism outlined here are organic to mankind rather than an artificial means to create a new man or a new type of society. Although foundationalism, when executed, will indeed be a very different type of society from how we live now. So this is something that's going to come up in Haywood's Manifesto a lot. It's not this, but it's this. You're going to hear it over and over and over again. Rather than an artificial means to create a new man or a new type of society, when executed, it will indeed create a very different type of society from how we live now. Okay, but what he's actually claiming is that we're going to a future that's in the past, or a past that's in the future, I guess is the better way to put it. Um, so we're going to accord ourselves to the reality as foundationalism understands it. So we're, maybe foundationalism becomes the mirror in which we reflect reality so that we can move forward into our future past. If that makes any sense to you, what you're seeing is you're building out a crackpot systematic philosophy that's going to have gurus in charge of it, like Haywood. And in truth, he says, foundationalism is two things, the renewal of society or the rebuilding anew of a crumbled society combining with the uh, combined with the long-term maintenance of that society. Mm. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to break the world or the world's already been broken. We're going to take all the pieces. We're going to put them back together again using foundationalism. And then we're going to maintain the thing by gluing it together. Like I was saying before, left-wing postmodernism is liquid postmodernism. It dissolves. And it has no real in intention of, of putting things back together. It's going to turn the whole world into a sea, and the gurus are going to set themselves up as navigators on that sea, and you're going to have to deal with that. You're going to have to ask, what is woman? As a matter of fact, foundationalism, on the other hand, is going to crumble, take the, they believe society has already crumbled, but it's going to finish the job. He actually says things to that effect. And then what we're going to do is we're going to cobble the pieces back together with foundationalism as the glue that holds it together in its new shape, which is also going to be its past shape. It's future shape, but it's past shape, you know, the future past. Foundationalism, he says, does not guarantee happiness. Well, I'd say that it probably guarantees a bunch of not happiness, as a matter of fact. The, uh, here's a long word, the apocatasta, uh, I should have read this in, in advance clearly instead of just in my head, apocatastasis, the universal reconciliation is not its concern. So it's not going to try to do a full Hegelian unity pro program. It is not an ideology. It does not offer all the answers. What it offers is a positive vision for a maximized future. Well, that sounds fantastic. It's the positive vision for a maximized future where Marxism is the negative vision toward a maximized future. Okay. The goal is to muddle through to get is to sorry, the goal is to all muddle through together to achieve as much human flourishing as reasonably possible, buffering the miseries inherent to human life. Foundation that sounds okay, but there's a lot of devils in these details. Foundationalism offers all members of society a chance for meaning, for transcendence, not through utopian ideology, but through rebasing ourselves in the real. I wish that were true. You'll notice at no point did he say shit about freedom or liberty. Foundationalism is grounded in what is universally known to be true. 
Well, there's some gaps in that knowledge, and there are some points that are contentious. Or what was once universally known to be true? Well, it turns out a lot of that was wrong, like that the Earth is at the center of the universe, was universally known to be true, and turns out wrong. It does not invent new truths. Thus, it contains a strong bias toward traditional Western knowledge and modes of thought without calcification of application. The asteroid miner who knows his Aristotle and his Aquinas and extracts metals to build great works with a picture of Henry the Navigator in his rocket ship, he is a foundationalist. And what if he's a Muslim? The aim of offering an interlocking, coherent program is to inspire men of destiny. Ooh, that's a Hegelian concept. See, what Hegel believed is that history has moved along. First he said history uses people and then discards them, but the main ones that move history are men of destiny who realize their roles as historical agents and seize the, seize the moment and rise up and become a man of destiny to drive history to its next stage. And his ideal for that was Napoleon Bonaparte, who was a dictator, who crowned himself, who claimed that he found the, the, the crown of France lying in a gutter and picked it up with his sword, which happens to be a remark that I first heard at the conference where I first met Nate Fisher and Matt Peterson, as it turns out, where these things were being discussed and Napoleon was held up uh, rather positively in that particular regard. So the, it is a coherent interlocking coherent program to inspire men of destiny to help those of like mind recognize one another okay so it's a cult and to allow us to see when our leaders are on the right path you know your definition of right path and whatever uh, might differ if enough of us make foundationalism the touchstone of our political action, we will maximize all of our chances for civilizational success. That's a bold claim that is probably not true. Still, history goes up and down. Good people in charge are followed by bad, and everything is a mix of light and dark. So we're getting into the same kind of Manichaeanism, Gnosticism that inspired Hegel, to talk not just about the man of destiny, but in fact the cunning of reason, which was a very key concept in Hegel's philosophy, because Hegel thought, being a, a mysticist, that all of the material world is ultimately bad, and reason itself is actually bad, but evil works to do good ends because of the cunning of reason, where reason here actually is um, equated between God, or the mind of God, and his own philosophy. And so... The Hegelian flavors here are overwhelming to somebody who has read Hegel. All we can hope for, he tells us, is to have a political system that is based in reality and that encourages virtue among the great and small, which allows for human flourishing at all levels. Foundationalism is that system. Foundationalism is the politics of future past. It is a new thing for a new time informed by the wisdom of the past. Foundationalism is not restorationism. There is no return. The way is shut. That's why they accuse me of wanting to go back to the 90s and just say go all over again. What is instead needed is a new thing, just as the Enlightenment was a new thing and as the flourishing of Western medieval thought was a new thing. Erase the errors and begin again. Foundationalism ushers in the new dawn. That's a very hermetic concept as well, um, but it also is one that's rooted in like Benjamin Franklin's probably Masonic interpretation of the sunrise on the chair that they put um, when he was asked if it was a rising or setting sun. He said it was certain to be a rising sun. Well, it turns out that people like Haywood and the Christian Nationalist Group and maybe the Society for American Civic Renewal all seem to believe that the rising sun that Benjamin Franklin described has now set, and it's time for a new rising sun. They believe that the American experiment is over and has failed. Their tweets, if you tweet in their vicinity about the goodness of the Constitution, they will tell you it's a failed document. Nate Fisher will appear to ask you whether or not you include the 14th Amendment. He will get all worked up about it. It's an interesting choice to make. Um, why we need drastic change, Haywood says, I have written extensively elsewhere on what is wrong with the modern world. I will not repeat myself here, although I will in my future book-length exposition of foundationalism so that it will be complete in itself, except to say the path we are on leads to a dead end. 
There is no shame in admitting this sad fact. The only shame is the foolishness of pretending that history is still moving in a direction it is not. So we can see again this acceptance of the concept of history moving. History is moving. History is moving through the hands of men, perhaps, or through the ideals or the foundations or something like that, which is the historicism at the heart of the Hegel Project and the Marx Project, where they both had independently, or not independently, Marx was a student of Hegel in, in, in essence, uh, decided that they had understood the true scientific nature of history and its movements and had chosen the correct future directions for it to take. For Hegel, he describes that in Philosophy of Right and outlines a constitutional monarchy that looks bizarrely like what is outlined by Christian nationalism, and these guys are frequently, explicitly constitutional monarchists. They want a king over America and over maybe the world, they want a king again, and that king will be apparently limited and bound by constitutional powers, except if we agree that they are Schmidians, we realize that his sovereignty exists only insofar as he can grant himself exemptions to that limitation. Now, you'll also note if you are fool around with these people much that they won't criticize the real causes of the problem, which turn out to frequently be the British royal family and the Danish royal family and the other old royal families of Europe. Perhaps even these matrilineal lines like the House of Garcenda, they don't talk about these things, but that doesn't matter. History is moving, and history is going to use people and then discard them, as Hegel said, is a vibe that we're getting here. He says the source of our society's problems is singular, autonomic liberalism. This reminds me of when Marx says that the problems in our society are singular, and he creates this word capitalism, which is an ideology that drives allegedly people to embrace a very exploitative version of market economies. Uh, capitalism is a straw man of market economies created by Karl Marx to be able to be the foil to his communist theory. Well, he is not talking about classical liberalism or liberalism in a philosophical sense, or even liberalism as it has evolved uh, in its better ways, but not necessarily the progressive aspects that colonized it in the in, in, under particularly Wilson and going forward. Um, but this thing, autonomic liberalism, he's not talking about liberalism, but he says this is the philosophy of the Enlightenment. I don't think it is. Um, but autonomic, nomic refers to laws, and auto is self, so it would be laws unto yourself, liberalism, the philosophy of the Enlightenment, which is actually based on rule of law, where nobody, not the self, the self is not the arbiter, that we erect laws instituted by what our, to say, Declaration of Independence called just governments. We have a big system of checks and balances that make sure the government stay just. There are outlined principles for what causes or defines a just government, at least in those documents. And allegedly, the laws that follow that all men, including the president of the United States or any so-called king that I didn't vote for, um, you could tell he's a king because he hasn't got shit all over him. Uh, those, everybody is subject to those laws. We hear that all the time about these bogus indictments of President Trump. Nobody's above the law, except obviously the Biden crime family is. So autonomic liberalism allegedly is the philosophy of the Enlightenment, even though the philosophy of the Enlightenment is literally based off of the concept of the rule of law, primarily referring to English common law, uh, which precedes, in fact, the Enlightenment rather significantly. But it says he says, he, like any good Gnostic, uh, pretends that the seductive vision lies somewhere else. He says, autonomic liberalism, the philosophy of the Enlightenment, which offers a supremely seductive vision. The dream is false. He says, look around, ye mighty. So here he's invoking um, the, the poem Ozymandias. Look around, uh, look upon my works, ye mighty, in despair, was what's on the uh, platform for the statue of Ozymandias, but all that's left is the platform and maybe his feet, because the statue is crumbled and is in an empty desert. So there's this great ironic, you know, image here of the invincible ruler who's been destroyed. The dream is false of liberalism. He's comparing this to Ozymandias. The dream is false. Look around, ye mighty. Yet Western man has tied himself to this millstone even as it pulls him down to the depths, meaning allegedly whatever autonomic liberalism is. My sincere belief is that these people don't have the slightest fucking idea what liberalism is, and every time I talk to them, I become so convinced of it that I refuse to debate them. 
The dream must end, for its poison and man cannot flourish until it is broken. So we know his target, foundationalism's target, is to eliminate liberalism, which he calls autonomic liberalism, uh, which is not at all the philosophy of the American experiment that he believes has failed, that the dream is false. So if you wondered if this is really American civic renewal, it is not. It is absolutely not, because its goal is actually to revise the entire concept of America and reconstitute it. It is the other brand that they have, which is new founding, a new founding with a new nation that's been newly reconstituted. Because the dream of America, the American dream, must end for its poison and man cannot flourish until it is broken. Remember, the pieces are going to be put back together with the glue of foundationalism. Thus, the iron core of foundationalism is that it opposes autonomic liberalism. You'll notice that the truth is not its iron core. He said all this nice-sounding shit about reality a minute ago. He didn't talk about how we're going to ascertain reality except as a reflection through foundationalism. But it's not truth or reality that's at the iron core of foundationalism. It is the opposition to autonomic liberalism, which is his straw man of classical liberalism. So the iron core of foundationalism is that it opposes autonomic liberalism and plans to destroy it as foundationalism's first act. So whatever he's calling autonomic liberalism is a fiction of his own creation as a stand-in, a straw man for classical liberalism and how it's evolved over the history of the United States through including the progressive poisons and the current communist assaults that are being very effective at attacking some of its, its, its uh, civic principles. And so his goal is the communists want to finish off liberalism, so let's not let them, let's destroy it ourselves. We could go back and read again, as I did on a previous podcast, about um, illiberalism left and right from Mao's combat liberalism, which basically he makes the same point. The first thing we got to do is get rid of liberalism. So in agreement with Mao Zedong on that. And the reason is because he gives a straw man that we might be able to summarize as autonomic liberalism and plans to destroy it. So the American experiment straw manned into something he's created as autonomic liberalism, self-law, liberalism, the destruction of that is foundationalism's first act. Only when the Enlightenment, political philosophy based on false claims of wholesale human emancipation from all unchosen bonds, is both gone and wholly discredited, is a new thing possible, he says. The Enlightenment is not a political philosophy based on false claims of wholesale human emancipation from all unchosen bonds. It is, in fact, a recognition that we are able to ascertain reality for ourselves, and we are able to, um, he's going to say, well, ha, that's your autonomic. You could no, we can ascertain reality for ourselves and that no person therefore deserves political authority over anybody else because nobody is God or nobody is a Gnostic. Um, we do not have any desire for all unchosen bonds. And in fact, we start in classical liberalism with the idea that there are self-evident truths which bind everybody, as a matter of fact, whether you like them or not, that all men are created equal and are down by their creator with certain inalienable rights among them, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, a.k.a. property. Okay, so we have an inalienable right, meaning we can't even set it aside for ourselves, to property. So this is John Locke. You don't get more classical liberal than this, which means... I can't take your property, which means I am bound by a system that will have to be regulated by law that prevents me from being able to lawfully take your property or life or liberty. So this is quite literally shit. Just because the communists have come up per with perversions of these ideas and tried to cr claim rights that abrogate other people's rights does not mean autonomic liberalism is the Enlightenment philosophy where human emancipation from all unchosen bonds is the heart of the Enlightenment project. It was never the heart of the Enlightenment project. It was always human emancipation from all arbitrary authority, all rulers who would tell us that they have some special insight into the true, the good, and the beautiful, and therefore have some right, perhaps divinely ordained in their own eyes, of course, to rule over us. 
That's what liberalism throws off. It throws off arbitrary power, which is explicitly contained, for example, in in a beautiful expression in the uh, Constitution of the state of Tennessee, which I did a whole podcast about before, but it's worth me looking it up and reading it again. So let me see if I can find this really quickly. This is so beautiful. It is um, Article 1, Section 2 of the State Constitution of Tennessee, which is one of the most based documents I've ever read. It says, That government being instituted for the common benefit, the doctrine of non-resistance against arbitrary power and oppression is absurd, slavish, and destructive of the good and happiness of mankind. Just to kind of put a fine point on that. So... No, that is not the philosophy of liberalism. I told you these people don't understand it. They want to destroy the thing they don't even understand is keeping them from being destroyed themselves. It is not the philosophy of human emancipation from all unchosen bonds. It is human emancipation from all arbitrary power power based on nothing but another person's claim to it, which if we could take Haywood at his word and let him uh, speak that he is a, a believing and practicing Christian, he would know because he would know that he is not God and neither is his neighbor. So nobody, he nor his neighbor is God. So neither is granted any particular political authority to rule over the other. But he would also know, if he knows his Christian theology, that Satan is the one who claims worldly authority and teaches people to wield it over one another. In Christian belief, leaders are not leaders, they are servants. And our founding fathers got this right. In other words, the Enlightenment liberals, when they outlined the political philosophy that went with their other philosophies, understood human nature in a true way that actually addressed these problems. These fools think that it means something it never meant. These fools have taken the communist straw man, which has largely been put into practice thanks to people like Woodrow Wilson, very significantly, when the progressive era supplanted itself and started calling itself liberal, even though it's not. It's openly illiberal. Remember, Mao wrote combating liberalism or combat liberalism in 1937. So they take the communist mistake about what liberalism actually, they take the communist vision as tantamount or the progressive vision, the Hegelian or Rousseauian romantic vision as what society should look like, man. Uh, everywhere man is born, for, no, man is born free, but everywhere he's in chains. That's Rousseau. That's the fundamental Gnostic expression of the modern era, which is not a Enlightenment liberal position at all, unless you ask idiots like Yoram Hazoni, who take Rousseau to be an Enlightenment thinker. The French Enlightenment, if you want to call it the Enlightenment, was a Gnostic reaction. It was not, in fact, Enlightenment at all. But in the United States, we use the Scottish Enlightenment for our basis. The German idealist one doesn't count. The French Romantic one, which kind of inspired it, doesn't count. We have the Scottish one based on English common law, and the actual basis is that nobody has political authority over one another except that which is lent with their consent and with limitation so that we are never subject to the arbitrary power of tyrants and megalomaniacal apocalyptic fools like Charles Haywood and his Society for the American Civic Renewal cult that he started with his big, big checks. But anyway, I digress. He says until this straw man he's created of liberalism is both gone and wholly discredited is a new thing. Uh, Only after it's that is a new thing possible. For if not, the serpent will whisper his sweet lies in men's ears forever, keeping them fixed in the dream become nightmare. Um, That's some beautiful, eloquent writing there, Chuck. Um... But let me just point out to you that uh, the iron law of woke projection never misses. Don't talk to us about the serpent. You don't even know what you're talking about. You literally have fallen for it yourself. Why a wholesale destruction and replacement, he asks, rather than an incremental than incremental corrections? What we are told is the prim and proper conservative solution to problems because foundationalism does not aim to conserve. It is a wholesale rebellion against the powers of the modern world, which realizes that those powers must be shattered, the world must be broken to clear the way for new growth. So right-wing postmodernism doesn't liquefy the modern, it shatters it and glues it back together in its own image. 
I think I can rest my case that that's his program. A wholesale rebellion against the powers of the modern world, which he's conflating the communist assault on classical liberalism and liberalism itself to create a straw man called autonomic liberalism that he says is the philosophy of the Enlightenment, even though it's easily demonstrably not the philosophy of the, philosophy of the Enlightenment in the first place. And so based on that, we're going to shatter the world and rebuild it according to foundationalism's new vision, which is going to be in 12 pillars. He says, but as I say, uh, the demonstration of why this is essential has already been made, and I will not repeat it here. Thank you, Guru Shampoo. Shampoo Guru, that's what I should call you. Daddy. Daddy Haywood. Shampoo Guru. Today, therefore, answers the what of foundationalism, not the why, other than to say foundationalism is a means for mankind to return to the path of flourishing, and that all, and, and sorry, and that is all the justification we need. So uh, yes, I agree. American society is teetering. It is under rampant assault. It has been infiltrated and subverted for decades. It is in bad shape, and it needs a lot of help. However, what it does not need is to be shattered and remade in some goofball's image especially some goofball that doesn't even understand what he's after. So what are the 12 pillars? Foundationalism is a woven thing, wept and, or sorry, weft and warp. Should be wept. Jesus wept. Foundationalism is a woven thing, weft and warp. It has 12 pillars, key principles upon which it is to be built, each one flexible and supporting the others. That sounds great. Flexible pillars. Put a roof on that, bro. I discuss each in turn. Because I have written extensively on each of these topics elsewhere here, I will offer this, uh, the summary principles and rationales and then direct the reader to lengthier earlier writings that include more extensive treatments of the theme. Most of these are book reviews or more accurately vehicles for my thought masquerading as book reviews. He related the story on um, Tucker that he has started out his writing path in developing this philosophy by writing book reviews of books on Amazon, became a high-ranking viewer or reviewer on Amazon number 31 or something overall, which is pretty astonishing, and then got banned because of his conservatism. I'm willing to bet there were some pretty solidly wingnut ideas in there, but whether or not Amazon should ban him for that, I don't know what he wrote, but book reviews are where he developed his philosophy, in particular including his book review of 14 books at the same time about Franco that he refused to characterize as being about Franco when he talked to Tucker about it. Thus, he says, I am not repeating here everything I have said before in the interest of keeping this manifesto of manageable length. However, again, the book-length version of the Foundationalist Manifesto, The Politics of Future Past, will stand completely alone for those who like that sort of thing. That's your cult and nobody else, bro. Nor should the Twelve Pillars be thought of as necessarily complete. They are guideposts and supports, not the structure of a temple of worship, or for worship. Yeah, no shit. You have flexible pillars. It's going to fall down. Times change and new challenges arise. Those challenges can be met with the underlying principles of foundationalism. Most of all, that reality is. Well, it depends on how you ascertain it. You see, the relationship between truth and reality really matters. It's not as simple as you're saying, Chuck. It's not as simple, shampoo guru. It is not that simple. You have reality. Reality is. Okay, so you're a realist. There are lots of philosophies that turn out to start with the admission that reality is, that are realist in their orientation, and that we can apprehend and ascertain something about it. But then we have to understand that truth has something to do with how we understand reality, which means that truth and reality are in some relationship. In Western classical liberalism, based on, actually, Aristotle, which you've already kind of held up, um, we use the correspondence theory of truth, that which corresponds faithfully to reality is true to determine what truth is. We call the science or the study, the philosophical study of that epistemology. And we have very well-developed but also tainted and corrupted tools that we call the scientific methods in order to, in, among others, in biblical studies, we would have the exegesis toward authorial intent, which would probably discredit everything you do um, if followed faithfully. So what we have is that we are trying to drill down to what any rational observer could agree is true. That's the actual idea behind liberalism, that we are all rational agents ourselves, not autonomic laws unto ourselves, but we are rational agents who can ascertain and understand the world for ourselves, and that we're going to build our society on the rock of truth. And that which is true is that which corresponds faithfully to reality and the way that we're going to guess as to what is true because it's the best we can do because the truth is in the realm of God only is that we are going to say that which corresponds to uh, 
any rational observer arriving at the same conclusion is something that we can uh, nail down as being likely to be true. So it turns out the method matters a lot. If you're reflecting through foundationalism, just like Hegel reflecting through Vernunft and Marx reflecting through socialism, then you unfortunately are not following the path of wisdom. You are not actually loving philosophy. You're loving your own philosophy, just like Hegel, just like Marx. And you're just going to be another motherfucking tyrant, just like every one of their philosophies has spawned in practice. So that matters a lot. By the way, when I said before that nobody is God and therefore nobody has authority over one another, that is why we use the principle of scientific universality in order to understand our relationship between truth and reality, aka epistemology, rather than, say, a Gnostic approach, which would be called nociology. The reason is because I don't have any authority to say reality is how it is. That's superior to your authority to say reality is how it is. There is no your truth and my truth. They're not in competition, and we don't have power disputes to figure out who's right. And we don't reflect off of some abstruse ph philosophical system to figure out who's right. We do the experiment. We check. And where that can't be done, we can have debates, and we can agree to disagree, and we have lots of conflict resolution methods. But the fact of the matter is, nobody gets the final say, and nobody gets uh, special authority to determine what is and is not true, is at the heart of the actual Western liberal tradition that you don't understand. It's not how foundationalism would interpret reality that turns out to get to win because we're all doing a foundationalist system. You've adopted the postmodernist frame that there is no actual universal objective knowledge, there is in fact only interpreted knowledge that runs through various interpretive frames. As again, I say, you're running postmodern conservatism. The first pillar, space. For a program designed to build on the lessons of history, space may seem like an esoteric starting point. I question the use of that particular word, esoteric. It has a meaning. Haywood seems smart. Seems like he would know that. Strange, peculiar, odd, unexpected are words that are not synonyms to esoteric, although some people think they are. Queer is another that is also not necessarily uh, a synonym to esoteric, but esoteric has a very specific meaning. It means that it's a hidden meaning to what's going on. Um, there's the exoteric meaning, which is the outward facing meaning, and the esoteric meaning, which is the hidden meaning. The insider, the cult, the club, the secret society, the secret double handshake meaning. It's an odd choice. Maybe he's just not as linguistically savvy as he claims to be on Twitter, because he says he's a gloriously, unbelievably good writer uh, in his megalomania. He says, but it is not an esoteric starting place, for in a very real sense, space is the crux of all things for the future man, a future of man, and contains within itself all the seeds of our future flourishing. Insisting on space as critical to human flourishing reflects an underlying reality about what man needs. Man is occasionally capitalized and occasionally not. I don't know if there's rhyme or reason to that. Warp or weft, I think is how we're supposed to say it. Weft or warp. Space offers a place for humans as humans to achieve and excel, to e execute the works of man under the eyes of God. This vision informs foundationalism of the uh, quest for space both as an independent good and as the engine and fortifier of other more explicitly political elements of the program. Now, we explained on Tucker Carlson very explicitly that he's not meaning space as a pun here, by the way. He's not meaning the space that we occupy. He means outer space. He means like rocket ships and mining asteroids like you mentioned earlier. By conquering space, he said, I do not mean any very specific accomplishments which must be determined by circumstances. I mean the rebirth of a mental attitude that views great deeds achieved through daring and a love of excellence exemplified by modern achievements in space as it was exemplified in exploration and conquest during the creation of today's world by the Christian West and only by the West over the past 800 years. He apparently forgot about other dynasties or other, other gigantic um, empires, uh, but only the West, Genghis Khan, did not have any conquest or anything. Uh, but he says over the past 800 years, right? So the the West colonized the world, and we need to keep colonizing. So we're going to have to colonize into space because we can't go colonize the rest of the world anymore um, or something. 
Ideally, that would include human beings permanently expanding into space because that is the most inspirational and the greatest work, but it could also mean any number of other achievements from greatly expanded robotic probes done for purely scientific purposes to asteroid mining for economic gain. Space, like any unifying goal, also has important cultural benefits. Thus, for example, a new optimism driven by space will encourage people to have more children and to honor those who do, reversing the most critical technical problem we face today, underpopulation. Our birth rates declining is a significant problem. He's not wrong about that. Thinking that we're going to put people on the moon or Mars or in space or whatever could, in fact, inspire people. Well, we got to make babies to put on Mars. I mean, look at the Mormons. They made a lot of babies to colonize the West, and sure they did. The quest for space will also encourage the talented young to direct their talents to productive endeavors where they will receive honor and prestige and away from the destructive or parasitical activities. I don't disagree with that either. Having a quest and a goal, something you want to achieve and that you could actually achieve high levels of status, which is really what it's about, by succeeding in those goals does drive young people to want to chase those dreams instead of dicking off on TikTok all day. I don't disagree with Haywood on that. Furthermore, it will unify to some degree our heterogeneous society. There is neither Jew nor Greek in working together for grand goals. This is actually also true. Simply put, space will help to renew our world. Necessarily, scientific, industrial, and technological achievement unparalleled in human history will be both a requirement and result of conquering space, but actions tending to transhumanism or any that denies human dignity or the laws of God or of nature will be directly and indirectly suppressed. And pseudosciences, including most of what currently passes for so-called social science, will be held in contempt. Okay, so we do see that the quest to conquer space is going to become a fernumft over the first and, and maybe... That's good. Maybe there is some need. I gave a lecture a long time ago, a podcast about the need for theology to bind and orient toward the good, all of the other sciences, so we don't end up with Yuval Noah Harari telling us that humans are hackable animals and free will is over, and we're going to build a Noah's Ark for the rich. I don't know that I agree with foundationalism just because it wants to colonize space as being this great thing. I also don't think that's necessarily the only place we might look. The second pillar, a mixed government of limited ends and unlimited means. Now, this is some slippery stuff right here. So, unlimited means. So, there's your Schmidtian Unbound Executive right there. The government will have unlimited means to achieve its ends, but the goal will be that it has limited ends. You see that? So, a government that has effectively unbridled power to achieve whatever it wants is going to be limited in what it wants to achieve. And he claims that that's going to happen because foundationalism is so deeply invested in virtue, which sounds a little unrealistic and naive. The aim of the foundationalist government is to allow human flourishing, to implement in the words of C.S. Lewis, quote, the ordinary happiness of human life, end quote. No form of government is perfect, even in the moment, much less over decades or centuries, and so no sorry, and no precise structure of government is always better than any than every other. What is best depends on the times and circumstances, so the structure of foundationalist government will inevitably change over time. What the exact structure will be is not ours to say, but of those who rule at that moment. So, for example, if you decide that dictatorship, authoritarianism, totalitarianism are necessary in the moment, say to achieve the utopia or something, well, he would eschew the utopia, but whatever. If we need a dictatorship to get through this particular moment in history, then a dictatorship is correct. If we need totalitarianism to get through this moment in history, then that's correct also, because our unlimited means government is going to have to take the form that gets the job done. In other words, the ends justify the means, but we're going to have very limited ends. So the the means are always going to be justified by the ends, but the the means, or sorry, the ends themselves are going to be very limited. That's his weird philosophy. And he thinks that people that rise as men of destiny within this, like Napoleon, are going to adhere to that. Napoleon went riding, gallivanting around Europe, trying to take over the whole freaking place. But for certain, foundationalism will be a mixed government, so maybe like a constitutional monarchy, like Hegel's philosophy of right, okay, long known as the only feasible type of stable government. So there's going to be check, checks and balances on power, except maybe if you're too Schmidtian and then you have the un unbound executive, but the government itself will have unlimited means to achieve its limited ends. 
the new government will be a protector of the collective of society in its spiritual aspect. Well, that sounds like something I really don't want to hand over to you, motherfuckers. It will represent the nation as it should be, not reflect the general will. It could be Augustine, a limited dictatorship, and almost certainly will be to begin. So it's going to start as a dictatorship, boys. It could be aristocratic, like Venice in its prime. It will not be... Now, you remember he said it'll be whatever it needs to be? It will not be democratic, because that system is unnatural and destructive at scale. The people will not directly command any decision, although some limited franchise and some analog to the Roman tribunes of the people is likely to make sense. All elements of society will be represented, but not necessarily participate, and not all elements of society will rule. Sounds like the disclaimer at the end of a prescription commercial. But there's a lot there in that little disclaimer. So you heard, first of all, it's going to start probably as a dictatorship, and it might have an aristocracy, which is going to be in practice an oligarchy. Um, and it's definitely not going to be democratic because he hates that. And, you know, what Charles Haywood hates is what is going to dictate what is and is not good within foundationalism because he's a megalomaniacal, apocalyptic uh, maximum leader. But he says the people are not going to have direct control over anything. And he mentions this concept of limited franchise. You'll hear these guys, if you pay attention to them, that are in this club or at least adjacent to it, use this term limited franchise a lot. Oren McIntyre has been talking about limiting the franchise. You're going to hear a lot about it. In fact, lots and lots of people that are taken in by this many of whom are likely to be feds, are feeding this line right before the 2024 election cycle really ramps up, by the way, of limiting the franchise to build out a conservative principle that say women shouldn't vote and some will stay home. And so we lose lots of votes or a, a principle that the franchise should be limited to landowners only. And they are making arguments for limiting the franchise of voting. In fact, very few people should vote. Only the people with the right ideology should, should vote, just like the way that Lenin laid out the difference between the bourgeois democracy that people have in, you know, an actual free society versus the proletarian democracy that is an ideal democracy that suppresses all elements that it doesn't like. Uh, huh. And so all elements of society will be represented, but not necessarily participate, and not all elements of society will rule. You know what that sounds like? Stakeholders. There will be stakeholders. You see, you're a stakeholder in what the environment, in the environment and in the corporations and what everything does, all the institutions. You're a stakeholder, so your voice matters. But unfortunately, there are too many stakeholders. It's too complicated. So what we need are experts who are going to be representatives for the stakeholders. They're going to go to the stakeholder council, um, the, the, a.k.a. the Soviet, that are going to decide at Davos what, it, what what's going to work. So in other words, he wants to build the same kind of system exactly with some other crackpot philosophy that Klaus Schwab wants to build, as if the left isn't going to colonize this exact replica of the thing they want to build and take it over the second they get the chance with all of the political power right in their hands to do it. See, because it's going to start off as a so-called limited dictatorship because those things are real. And that limited dictatorship will have all elements of society represented because they're stakeholders in society, but not necessarily participatory because you're going to have a limited franchise. And all of a sudden you land yourself right in stakeholder theory, just like Klaus Schwab with this stakeholder capitalism that he allegedly laid out back in the 70s, which he actually probably stole from Henry Kissinger. Great plan, shampoo guru. Under foundationalism, there will be execution of the laws as there must be, but bureaucracy will be sharply limited and will be strictly confined to executive action, having no rulemaking ability. I agree that the administrative state is a problem. I agree that that is an important debate to have. I agree that we have to figure that out. I agree we need to figure out how to do that, which are all hard questions. I don't think that foundationalism is a great way to go about it. Foundationalism, he says, will govern, not administer. General laws will address public interest, not private interests. Hmm, the public interest, the common good, which, of course, they know what that is, and those of us who aren't stakeholders don't know what that is, and so we're not, we're not allowed to participate. We won't have access to the franchise or to rule. The impact of the central government on daily life will be massively reduced. So you're going to have, you see, this unlimited power government with very limited means that's going to shrink somehow, even though it starts off as a so-called limited dictatorship with no actual clear path to how it's going to be limited. The impact of the central government on daily life will be massively, massively reduced since foundationalism does not believe in the arrow of history or technocratic rule. See, it doesn't believe in that, so it won't possibly get taken over by it. And it does not believe that the central government should dictate local practice. So, 
there's going to be this idea like we have with the American federal system where the federal government is fairly uh, allegedly weak. The state governments are in the 10th Amendment have rights reserved to them and the people in the 9th Amendment have rights reserved to them at the local levels. Nonetheless, he says, foundationalism will directly encourage virtue and discourage vice and forbid certain especially pernicious negative behaviors and reward or make a condition of national advancement certain positive behaviors. So it's going to have a social credit system built into it. Sounds fucking great, shampoo guru. Um, yeah, it's literally it's going to build out the same system that Klaus Schwab has with the stakeholder model and em- employ a social credit system to get there so that it can do exactly what it says, encourage virtue, discourage vice, according to their definitions in their own eyes, of course, and forbid certain especially pernicious negative behaviors, you know, just like how Mao said that one of the black categories of society were the bad elements, we've got to control the bad elements, and reward or make a condition for national advancement certain positive behaviors, in other words, a social credit system. Great. The foundationalist government can have limited ends, yeah, because that's what governments tend to do when they have unlimited power to, to achieve those ends. That is a light touch and a light footprint. You see, because the people getting stamped out by the government, unfortunately, aren't going to have a voice because they had a limited franchise. So they got taken away from them. So they're not really going to be able to redress their government or their grievances against the government because they've been limited in the franchise, unfortunately. So we have to trust that the virtue of the foundationalist cult is always going to stay pure enough so that this doesn't become an unwieldy problem where it starts off literally as an allegedly limited dictatorship. The question is not what comes next, like an aristocracy where they make all their buddies rich and limit the franchise to themselves. That's what an aristocracy is. But in fact, how do we stop this from becoming an unlimited dictatorship? Oh, we have to trust your fucking virtue? You're a megalomaniac. I don't think so. I literally don't think so. We have all of the liberal things that you hate, specifically so people like you can't become an unlimited dictator or even a limited one. But anyway, it will have limited ends. That is a light touch and a light footprint because it is reality based. Right. Viewing man as an autonomous individual rejects in principle organic social bonds, but this inevitably leads to tyranny as the only way to manage a multitude of autonomous individuals. So you can't have individual rights, guys. Not under foundationalism. We're going to make sure everybody's doing the right thing all the time. And the way of a social credit system we're building out it will be determined by the stakeholders in terms of what is good and bad and right and wrong to encourage that. By recognizing that man is by nature a social being and can only function well in an actual society of shared customs and beliefs, direct management of society is far less necessary and thus far less intrusive. See, when everybody's doing what they're supposed to, just like under communism, when everybody's doing what they're supposed to, when everybody believes in the foundationalist vision, everybody believes in the socialist vision, everything will work fine and we don't need much government. The government at the end of socialism, Lenin told us when it reaches its maximum zenith of power, will become irrelevant and it will wither away, just like Marx instructed. And that will occur when it reaches its zenith of power, when the limited dictatorship of the proletariat becomes an unlimited uh, dictatorship of the proletariat. And at that moment of maximum power, when it can finally enforce that the only people left in the entire system are perfectly committed socialists with perfectly understood communist ideology then you don't actually have to have government any longer. It'll be far less intrusive. None of this, he says, implies foundationalism will be a libertarian or minimalist government. Yeah, no shit. It's going to be gigantic. It's going to be a dictatorship. In pursuit of its limited ends, it will have unlimited means. Think about that for a minute. The government will have no restrictions on achieving whatever ends it decides are within its scope that it gets to set for itself through its shareholders, stakeholders. Oh... Just like Klaus Schwab, the modern administrative state has erased the crucial distinction in the minds of people between an intrusive government and a strong government. Modernists fail to understand that sovereigns were, before the modern era, constrained in a web of custom, which was law. See, custom is going to restrain all these dictators. They're going to be good people, and there's only going to be good people who rise through this absolute power structure that they're building. In order for foundationalism to succeed, this pre-modern understanding of sovereignty is essential. See, limited by custom. We just have to trust that the unlimited sovereign isn't going to mess up. Because he's a foundationalist, so he'll probably be great. But properly viewed, the state is not constrained externally. It contains it within itself as an organic outgrowth of a virtuous society, its own constraints. See, the virtue itself is going to 
kind of hold it. Further reading on the Marble Cliffs, Fitz, Fitzpatrick's War, the Forest Passage, Charlemagne, Augustus, Napoleon. Eh, right. Okay, great. Third pillar, virtue politics. See, virtue is going to be how it all works. The politics of foundationalism will be the politics of virtue. This means that foundationalism entirely rejects the Enlightenment. It sounds like a really bad strategy. Moral systems based on supposed emancipation, the search for equality, emotivism, that's romantic reaction, actually, that's not enlightenment, and similar grounds will vanish. See, they don't know the difference between romantic reaction to the enlightenment and the, rea uh, the enlightenment itself. Same mistake Yoram Hazoni over at National Conservatism repeatedly makes. I don't think they're actually making a mistake. I actually think they're either so deeply confused about what liberalism is because they're stupid and they refuse to listen to people who are actually trying to tell them otherwise, or they've never thought about it. Uh, or that they're actually purposefully trying to make something that is exactly what Klaus Schwab would need to finish his, his ends if the left isn't going to be able to accomplish it and you have to get it through the right. Or by setting the right up to be the foil that the left is going to respond to and say, oh my God, the, front, the fascists really are here. And now we need to have a police state run by the Biden administration in order to stop the fascists. All mention that he says a memory of John Rawls will be erased. So they're going to have the power to completely erase any mention and and memory of a philosopher they don't like. It doesn't matter if it's John Rawls. It doesn't matter if it's Alex Jones. It doesn't matter if it's Charlemagne. It doesn't matter if it's anybody. They will have under foundationalism in their limited dictatorship, apparently, with limited uh, ends, within their limited ends, the ability to completely erase all mention and memory of a philosopher they don't like. John Rawls, who, by the way, the woke mostly hate because while he was fairly progressive and uh, strongly egalitarian and had many flaws, I think, in his political philosophy that he called liberalism, he was still committed to some of the architectural pieces of liberalism. And the woke actually criticized the hell out of John Rawls. They're not really big fans of his further confusion on their parts. Haven't done the reading, just a shampoo guy that decided he's going to rule the world with a secret society that he could pay for. Foundationalism requires, he says, most of all, that the form of government is irrelevant if there is a complete lack of social of societal virtue, and that while society can tolerate an inevitable lack of virtue among some people and some classes, it cannot tolerate a lack of strong virtue among the ruling class. See, we're going to set up a class of the elect, the ruling class, who are going to be the virtuous people who they get to decide who, who's virtuous according to their own principles, which might just happen to be subscribing to their program or being in their secret society. And you can see how the whole freaking scam works. Without the most um, maiorum, the focus on tradition, the web of virtue that supports good government, the project will fail. So we have to just trust that all these guys are going to be virtuous, despite the fact that none of them act virtuously on social media. In fact, you could very easily figure out just by watching them behave that the first commandment of their entire project is to bear false witness. Um, they are relentlessly cruel to people that they disagree with. There's no punching to the right in their camp, but there's punching anybody, even slightly to their left, even if they would be a strong co-belligerent against the woke, which means they can only drift rightward until they fall off the right cliff. It's the exact same mistake that the left made with no punching to the left. But they know that power is found that way, and they are desperate for that power. The ring of power is calling them, and they, like Galadriel, will set themselves up as a beautiful queen who all will fear and worship. But they'll be virtuous, don't worry. Because it's inherently virtuous, right? Because if they're foundationalists, they're virtuous. You know, and being foundationalist means virtuous because it's very imbued in virtue, and they're going to study virtue, and they're going to erase philosophers like John Rawls that might challenge their idea of virtue, and that will make sure that they stay virtuous, and because they're virtuous and they are the ruling class, and we don't have any stake in saying anything and no franchise to say it if we wanted to, everything will stay virtuous, and that'll be great. That's literally their philosophy. The incoherence, they say, of the modern philosophers will be replaced with the older and proven teleological conception of man as filtered through Christianity. Bad news for all you guys else. The government will seek to encourage virtue in the populace, but the populace, and in particular the ruling class, is the necessary repository and driver of virtue if virtue is to permeate a society. 
The aim will be for society to seek the good, which is already known, see, because they're Gnostic, although its application to new circumstances and happenings may require discernment, which I'm, these guys are demonstrating having a lot of. They can't even tell the difference between progressivism and liberalism. They don't know the difference between enlightenment and re, uh, romanticism. They're good at discernment. And they're going to be virtuous. Don't worry. Virtue will be strengthened with rigorous application of social stigma and taboo. Oh, of course it will, tied in part to religion, but not wholly dependent on religion. No laws will protect any person from the effects of desirable stigmas and taboos. Quite the contrary. Emigration will be encouraged by any person who finds this unpleasant. In other words, they're going to decide what's going to be stigmatized, made taboo, and societally pressure you, or worse, there will be no protection from any bullying you get for not going along with the program, and if you don't like it, you're welcome to leave. Despite the fact that they are in the United States of America, and they don't like the program of the United States of America, and have decided that rather than leaving themselves and being a uh, emblem of their own virtue and demonstrating how that will work in practice, that they're going to stick right here and I think the words were something like smash the place to bits or break it to pieces or something like that and install their new program. Well, I encourage you, Shampoo Guru, emigration is encouraged to any person who finds the United States and its constitution unpleasant where laws will protect people from the effects of um, arbitrary power, including the stigmas and taboos that those uh, people with arbitrary power lay down unjustly. Conversely, he tells us, honors will be awarded for uh, to the deserving, those who accomplish and those who hew to the virtues demanded by the foundationalist society. See, if you are a foundationalist, you can be rewarded if you don't have that, you can leave, or we're just going to bully you, and no law will protect you. So we're going to have unity, you see, on a new basis. It starts with a desire for unity. First, we're going to have a desire for unity under a foundationalist basis. Then we're going to do criticism and struggle with no protection of the laws for people who don't like it. But they can leave if they want while they get the chance, just like you could leave China in the 1950s before Mao really clamped down. And then we will finally have un a new unity on a new basis called foundationalism, which will be very virtuous. It's the exact same freaking program. Yet foundationalism will not seek to attain perfect virtue among the populace, he says. Oh, so merciful. Mao said similar. The foundationalist government grasps that humans being who they are, some limited amount of vice is inevitable, especially among the lower orders of society. The intent will be to dampen and limit vice through approbation of virtue and stigma of vice, a social credit system, coupled with legal penalties for vice where appropriate. Culture and law will work hand in hand to maximize not perfect virtue. Who are his listed uh, pieces of reading here? The Machiavellians by James Burnham. Uh, Why Liberalism Failed by Patrick Deneen. Patrick Deneen is a Catholic integralist, by the way. He's kind of in the same set of things. Catholic integralism is the attempt to refuse church and state is the basis for most of the fascist programs in South America. We could get into it with Pope Leo, what is it, the 12th or 13th, whichever one did the Rorum, or what is it, Rorum, I forget, something like this. It doesn't matter. Patrick Deneen is an integralist. I do know what I'm talking about. I just can't remember what the Latin is. Um, he has Machiavelli listed also, by the way. But Patrick Deneen is a very interesting character because they put some pretty raucous stuff on social media. And some uh, at some point a few months ago, I have the screenshot still of where this happened. And somebody said, wait, so James Lindsay was right about you guys. And Patrick Deneen replied, yes. So everything I'm saying about them, they will recognize that what I'm saying about them is correct. Or at least Patrick Deneen did. And what I was saying is that they are fascists in the making, that they are tyrants, that they hate America, that they want to destroy the Constitution, that they are not our allies or even our co-belligerents against the woke, that they are a problem in, of, in and of themselves, but that they are also the necessary reaction in the alchemical formula the left is using to transform our society, which we've already covered. The fourth pillar, sex role realism. Now you're going to you would think sex realism would be great because of this trans stuff, and I think that's part of where it starts, but he said sex role realism. This is going to get really sticky real quick. The family, he says, man, woman, and children is the bedrock of all human societies. Okay. Restoring a realistic understanding of the role men and women in society, uh, the role of men and women in society is necessary for any society to flourish. The crucial fact about men and women in society is that they are and must be partners. 
that women cannot do everything that men can do and men cannot do everything women can do, and that even when each can do what the other can do, usually cannot do it as well, does not make one sex subordinate. So this sounds like the doctrine of complementarianism. But without recognizing and honoring this basic fact of different competencies, no society can operate for long. Foundationalism is explicitly anti-feminist. It regards the feminine as one of the two essentials of humanity. It regards feminism as a dest- as destructive distortion. That is correct. Uh, that it is. A return to traditional sex roles, which were not at all the fictional oppression we are told they were, is both desirable and necessary. The crucial truth is that men drive a society forward while women bind a society together. That's because the patriarchy is mostly women gossiping about other women in the very binding function. So it will always be in any successful society, and any society that attempts to contradict truth will only find its own destruction. Pretending that men and women are interchangeable destroys not only the family but achievement. See, we're going to destroy the idea of autonomic liberalism, so you, man or woman individually, you don't get to make decisions about what is right for you. That's going to be imposed on you. And you think, no, he can't really mean that. Oh, yes, he means that. He says, men seek glory, power, and dominance. This is why almost everything great in human history has been achieved by men. What women do is in some ways more important, but it will never be as visible. Women do not, unless given advantages, advance in a hierarchy through competition because the vast majority of women lack the drives necessary. I'm glad that the shampoo guru is such a profound student of uh, human psychology and sociology. In Western countries, the usual structure for well over a thousand years until the left project made the organic relationship a target has been a partnership between men and women where each is supreme in one sphere of family life, contained in a larger family web, but consults the other. Women indeed hold up half the sky, but their role in its nature is inward-facing and men's is outward-facing. In the West, there has never been any equivalent of the, quote, Eastern approach, typified by Purda, the separation and seclusion of women driven by defective religious or cultural imperatives that are the mirror image of feminism nor under foundationalism will there be, but there will be very different roles for men and women. Here we get this. No men... He doesn't tell Tucker Carlson this, by the way. He doesn't mention this part. He talks about what comes next, which is divorce, and that there are, at least I would say statistically, sex role adherence is probably good, but statistically means there's a lot of room for variation, and preserving individual liberty is necessary to deal with that variation. But he doesn't want that. That's autonomic, right? It's your lawn to yourself. He says, he doesn't tell Tucker Carlson this part, which I think is a pretty shocking omission, just like he omitted to mention that he meant Franco when he mentioned the the Spanish Civil War. Neither men nor women, he says, will be allowed to freely choose the path they want. So there it is explicitly. Neither men nor women will be allowed to freely choose the path they want. Foundationalism does not seek to implement fantasies of autonomy. So you will not be autonomous. You will be subordinate to the foundationalist uh, stakeholders. And you will be enforced by your social credit system. Social and legal compulsion will require each to make choices that benefit family and society. Women will not be permitted to choose career over family without significant penalties and disadvantages that hamper progress along such a path. Men will not be permitted to choose not to have a family. Oh, get to work, boys. Find you a bitch and make some babies. You have to. Men will not be permitted to choose not to have a family or to fail to provide and protect their family without significant penalties. In other words, society will reflect the natural division of the sexes, regardless of whether some people in society would prefer to make some other choice, whether because of their outrider nature, excessive focus on self, or because of ideology. See, we're going to achieve maximum flourishing this way. No fault divorce will be banned. Adultery will be socially punished and result in legal debilities. Modern technology that erodes healthy relationships between men and women from Tinder to online pornography will be rigorously suppressed. So I had a friend a number of years ago, there's a couple I knew, and the husband got addicted on his cell phone to playing um, Yahtzee. 
Do you remember the game Yahtzee where you roll the dice? He got totally addicted. He was playing it for like 10 hours a day. Like constantly playing Yahtzee. He was going to the bathroom and hiding to play Yahtzee. And his wife was really unhappy about that. So does his Yahtzee game on his cell phone constitute modern technology that erodes healthy relationships between men and women? And will it be vigorously suppressed? By foundationalism. The goal across all of society is to return to a natural partnership between men and women. This is very much not a siloed partnership where the man and woman each operate completely separately in pursuit of a unified goal. Instead, there is necessary overlap. A woman advises her husband in his role outside of the home, and the husband assists his wife in her roles inside of the home, particular, in particular with children, especially with boys as they come of age. You don't have to worry about your girls, boy, dads, you take care of your boys as they come of age. But also, simple relief of the drudgery that characterizes much household work. See, Shampoo Guru wants you to do the dishes for your lady, probably because his wife makes him do the dishes or something like that. I'm just speculating. But human nature dictates that those spheres and roles be different. I'm sure his wife informed him on that part in his great manliness. So, the fifth pillar because he has all of his book recommendations. I'm skipping. Sorry for the pause. The subordination of economics to politics. Oh, so we're going to create a political economy. Oh, no. Foundationalism honors private property as the basis of a free society. Private property, are you going to have the right to do as you will with your private property? No, you will not. So it's not really as you have an inalienable right to your own property. It's going to honor private property. It's not going to secure your inalienable right to private property. It doesn't want that. And maybe it's not you'll own nothing and you'll be happy where everything you have you rent, but it honors private property as the basis of a free society and assumes that most free exchanges are to be unfettered by any government intrusion. See, most of them. Foundationalism is not distributism, but it knows that concentrations of economic power are inherently corrosive and to be prevented by, and if necessary, shattered by direct government action. See, it's not actually distributism, which is going to distribute concentrations of wealth, but it knows that concentrations of too much money in one place are corrosive and dangerous, so they'll have to be shattered. If you get too big, going to have to blow it up. I think at some point, maybe it was on Tucker, maybe it's in here, I read that he said that nothing, nobody could have more than 5% control of any market. So if you, say, run the shampoo industry, you if your market share grows above 5%, you're going to have to be broken up by the government. So you can kind of have private property, but you can't really. It's going to be severely limited. He says, in no circumstance will a conflict between virtue and the free market be resolved in favor of the latter. So the foundationalists will define what's good and bad and virtuous, and they're a stakeholder, and you don't have any say because they've limited the franchise and how that works, and they will never decide that you can engage in any academic or economic activity outside of their virtue. In all instances, political choice will dictate the limits of economic choice, he says, in all circumstances. The specifics of our economic system are not a major concern of foundationalism. Oh, we won't have a—it's not distributism, but we're not going to really worry about the specifics. Certainly, any economic action based on unreality or on ideology, you know, maybe it's like the you get to find what's the, the maximum size of— uh, economic entity, and that you get to decide what's virtuous economic activity. Um, but anyway, certainly any economic action based on unreality or on ideology will be rejected in the fake, quote, work that currently makes up most of our, much of our, econo our economy will be eliminated. But whether we need a gold standard, what is to be the fractional banking ratio, and under what circumstances government might be useful to jog economic activity are strictly practical concerns to be addressed as necessary as a matter of ab not as a matter of abstract principle. In other words, the gurus will decide for us at the time. Central planning, he says, will be regarded with great suspicion, however, as tending not only to be not effective, but much more important to grow government and to cause it to interfere in matters not of its concern. Well, the aristocrats very frequently were not very uh, interested in central planning, so there you go. It's going to look more feudal than communist. Gotcha. Consumerism will be strongly discouraged, including by the imposition of stiff tariffs on foreign goods contributing to consumerism. Work, just like Herbert Marcuse. Work will be directed to production of goods and services with positive value, 
in the eyes of the foundationalists, of course. Rent seeking through manipulation of government or corporate structures will be rigorously discouraged through disincentives, including criminal penalties. Existing fortunes gained through rent seeking or of anyone who has materially supported destructive or evil causes will be wholly confiscated by the state. Well, that sounds just wonderful, doesn't it? The foundationalist state is aware that the achievements that flow from a successful state, especially one with unparalleled scientific achievement, lead to wealth, and that wealth, both itself and when greater wealth appears achievable, frequently undermines virtue. Tell us more, rich beyond avarice shampoo guru. There is no solution for this but a combination of social strictures and the offering of a frontier so that wealth is directed outward to achievement as much as possible. Work antithetical to societal flourishing will be forbidden or strongly discouraged. Work in areas of limited value, which currently absorbs a grossly excessive proportion of our intellectual energy, including law and financial engineering, will also be sharply curbed. We cannot achieve it. I'm sorry, we cannot achieve if our brightest minds waste their talents. This sounds very much like we have to get rid of bourgeois jobs, which he actually says, but not in that word. He says managerial elite jobs. He says that he won't let his kids go to school for managerial elite jobs, and he recommends nobody go to school for managerial elite jobs. And actually, on Tucker Carlson, he said all that. He also says that lawyers won't exist by 2030. The sixth pillar, intermediary institutions. Given the limited role of government in the foundationalist state, the implementation of virtue as well as education in virtue must occur on the local level and primarily through rebuilt intermediary institutions, which beyond virtue also strengthen the social web. I do not totally disagree with this concept. Intermediary institutions are important. Schools, churches, clubs, unions, and myriad other groups will be directly encouraged, strengthened, and rewarded. So you could make regular policy that encourages horizontal integration in society and breaks monopolies of accreditation and so on, but you could also do it his way. Foundationalism will of necessity be a high trust, not low trust society. Differences among people will not of themselves be encouraged, encouraged, rewarded, or valued. Interesting. So it will be a social credit system to participate in the intermediary institutions at that level. But the high trust, not low trust society is very interesting. You see, we're going to have a high trust society because differences among people will not of themselves be encouraged, rewarded, or valued. So everybody's going to get on board, of course, with the program of, of foundationalism, and we don't need differences. See, this reminds me of when Mao thought that everybody would come to socialism, and then he got so confident to that, he launched the 100 Flowers campaign where everybody was allowed to criticize the government because he was so sure it would strengthen socialism, and socialism would win out, and when that didn't work anymore, it wasn't going so well. Remember, he had a, uh, we'll say, um, limited government of unlimited means. He decided that what he would do is round up all the dissenters and kill them, um, it was a gigantic purge, the biggest purge in all of China's history, which was the 100 Flowers campaign, which got rid of all dissenters, silenced everybody else, allowed him to launch the Great Leap Forward, which only killed somewhere between 50 and 70 million people. I love this guy. Seventh pillar, subsidiarity. Now that's localism in effect. The idea is that we're going to trend toward localism. This is eighth and ninth amendment, or sorry, ninth and 10th amendment stuff, sort of when done right and well, but that's not what he wants. Remember when I said earlier that the idea would be kind of a refactored, well, I said that right-wing postmodernism would be like a refactored shatter. You shatter the system and refactor it. So instead of liquid modernity or liquid postmodernity, you have refactored modernity or postmodernity. Uh-huh. They're actually pushing for something called refactored subsidiarity. I don't remember if uh, Haywood, we'll see, actually uses that term, but that's actually the term. And refactored means that they're going to decide how everything works and at what size and what scale, hence like not getting bigger than 5% of any particular market. It says local interests will be looked after, See, but it's not distributism. It's called refactored subsidiarity. Local interests will be looked after by local people. There will be no national laws on the environment, on discrimination, on guns, on education, or any other of the vast majority of topics. Federal legislation, and therefore the administrative state now covers. Many types of action will not occur at any level of government. All charitable aid will be taken out of the hands of governments and given to private organizations who will be tasked with using that aid to reward virtue and punish vice. 
oh, so like the ESG scores, but through your program and you're not going to, the government's not going to give aid. You're just going to force the corporations to give aid according to however they want to, but according to your program. And if that checks off all your boxes, then you know, it's the ESG program all over again. So social credit for your corporation so that they will do virtue and vice. Got you. Yes, this will result, he says, in severe restrictions on autonomy for the recipi recipients. That's a feature, not a bug. So more strings with any money that you get because the ESG social credit system is going to be for real, but it won't be ESG. It'll be um, Haywood. I don't know, something. But that's a feature, not a bug, guys. He says, but it will also re result in the ability for most of the poor to regain their dignity, especially if coupled with other political changes. Government action with respect to the poor will be restricted to assisting the poor to lift themselves out of poverty a problem that has never been solved, um, despite lots of attempts, including by the communists. Very large and expensive projects that require national coordination will, however, be executed by the central government. These include substantial investments in grand public works, including both earthbound and in space. The latter will be implemented both as an economic matter to obtain potentially desirable resources and a, as a social and as a social matter to increase the prestige and glory of the nation, which is a public interest that binds the people together. So why don't we have these grand, awesome cathedrals? You hear the, you know, modernity sucks. People talk about that all the time. Look at what we used to build, these grand, awesome cathedrals, these amazing palaces that actually what you had was a dictator who impoverished or in, used slave labor to completely rip off his entire society to build something that was this genuinely grand work of art. Now, sometimes we look at some of the cathedrals in Europe and we look at some of the things that were built throughout Europe. Those are great. And maybe we should be looking at more of these inspirational public works and dedicating more money to that. However, you can also look at some of the czarist palaces that are in Russia that literally destituted an entire region when the megalomaniacal, um, the leader there decided that he needed the grandest palace with all the gold that you could possibly find and get stuck in one place. So that kind of cuts. Further reading includes a book called On Communitarianism, or actually it's not in italics, it's not a book. So he just wants you to read On Communitarianism. See, it's not communism, it's communitarianism. It's not actually uh, distributism, it's refactored subsidiarity. Uh, so communitarianism, if you look it up, is um, kind of like communism in a lot of ways, but more local. Uh, it, yeah, it's wonderful. You should look it up. You should do, take his advice, go read on communitarianism. The eighth pillar, hierarchy and order. Foundationalism, he says, recognizes that in all areas of life, hierarchies are both natural and desirable. That is correct. And Jordan Peterson, I think, was one of the most eloquent to speak on this. And he said that the least corrupt hierarchy you can form is one based on merit. In other words, when there is an objective, demonstrable ability to do the thing that the hierarchy is built around, whether that's build a company, whether that's sell shampoo, whether that's, um, you know, run 50 meter dashes, whatever it happens to be, their hierarchy develops. And when it's based on merit, that is the minimization of corruption. That was Jordan Peterson's extremely astute observation about hierarchy. Hierarchy is real. Hierarchy is common. Hierarchy is desirable. Hierarchy is natural. And hierarchy, he adds, is least corrupt. By the way, the, these people hate Jordan Peterson. Um, it is least, why do they hate Jordan Peterson? I don't know, maybe because he said hierarchies are least corrupt when they're based on demonstrable merit, not some abstrusely defined in-house decision on what is and is not virtuous within the philosophy, which is inherently corrupt. He says, in no instance will a hierarchy be seen as undesirable oppression. Foundationalism is a movement with an elite, but not for the elites. The foundationalist society will be of uh, will be one of order, but not because it is a police state. Quite the contrary, order will result from a combination of the political structures and the reborn virtue of the populace. Remember, they're going to get that by encouraging and discouraging the right and wrong behaviors through what can only possibly refer to a social credit system of one form or another. It, it if enforcement must be widespread, the society or at least part of the society is failing. Yeah, because everybody's going to get on board with your virtue program or whatever. And that's why, of course, the hierarchy is just going to be automatically good because it's based on virtue. And if it's based on virtue, how could it be bad? Uh, despite the fact that the definition of, com of virtue happens to be in-house and therefore self-serving. Crimes, he says, will be limited to crimes that are 
malum in se, no malum prohibitum crime shall exist, although civil penalties, fines, and debilities will be implemented for violation of what few regulations exist. Capital punishment will be imposed for major crimes and will be swiftly implemented. I wonder what those include. For non-capital crimes, corporal punishment will be the default rather than the impri- rather than imprisonment. Now, if you recall, so we're going to beat people who do non-capital crimes. There won't really be that many crimes, though, that are actually illegal. We're going to beat people who commit non-capital crimes, but otherwise it's going to be capital crime, swift, uh, swiftly implemented uh, death penalty, capital punishment for anybody in violation of the major crimes, whatever those happen to be. But if you remember earlier that he said if you didn't like the law, that you're going to be strongly encouraged to leave. So it sounds like not liking his system is one of these crimes. So you're probably going to get either, how are you going to get pressured to emigrate? Is that through the beatings or the threat of capital punishment? I mean, I'm really confused. Now, I mentioned just a minute ago that he doesn't particularly like Jordan Peterson, but for further reading on this particular crime and punishment hierarchy stuff. He actually references 12 rules for life with Jordan Peterson. It's very interesting that he elevates Jordan Peterson about the natural hierarchy thing and it's the lobster stuff, but fails to mention the kind of key piece that, as a matter of fact, um, a non-corrupt merit-based system is what's necessary. But he probably believes that. Like, you can have merit in being the best communist and that's the communist corrupt system actually can reward merit if we redefine merit the way that Marx would because uh, he redefines truth to be that which advances theory so we could inv- define truth and success as what advances foundationalism and its definitions of virtue and then you can have merit and being good at his system but that's by definition corruption the ninth pillar Christian religion this is where we finally get to the Christian nationalist part even though all the people are that are pushing Christian nationalists the hardest are either in cahoots with this guy directly uh, in one of his lodges or uh, circumstantially apparently like Doug Wilson in Moscow Idaho maybe he's not involved in this I don't know it's not listed on on the uh, registration um, I don't know we don't know Uh but also the people that are pushing the Christian nationalism stuff, like Josh Abatoy, who's involved with a lot of this stuff going by, by business on, on social media. There are lots of weird hints and that they all like and share and, and amplify and defend one another, you know, very vigorously, often using repeated terminology is very suggestive that the Christian nationalist movement at the heart of the question of this podcast, what the fuck is Christian nationalism really, reading this manifesto, uh, seems to be part of this ninth pillar of Christian religion. Foundationalism, he says, does not offer an ideology. Transcendence is not offered through the state. But every sound society must have an impeller to virtue and to achievement, which was space, I thought, and a mechanism for transcendence. Religion, though itself an ideology of sorts, can be one of those impellers. Achieving virtue in the people, both the ruling classes and the masses, though especially for the former, along with driving accomplishments that will echo down the ages of man, are among the ends of foundationalism, and right religion uh-huh, is a key component to both. Only one religion, Christianity, has ever been associated with success in both areas, and it is true, which is a bonus. Therefore, see, it's not particularly interested in what is true, it's primarily interested in what works, and then, oh, it's a bonus that it's true. Therefore, Christianity will be the officially favored religion of the foundationalist state, replacing the great heresy of modernism, our currently officially favored religion. The state's overarching goal in favoring Christianity will be to seek the common good, as defined in their own eyes, of course, and a realistic amount of virtue and flourishing, unless you happen to be one of those, you know, outriders of male or female expression who are going to be forced into male and female traditional roles. The society standards of virtue will not emerge from a purely confessional basis, but most of those standards will be derived from Christianity. So Christianity, you see, isn't really this thing he's that all into, um, which may explain why he doesn't seem to know the doctrine very well, even though he says he's a practicing and believing Christian. Um, We're not going to nail down anything too specifically, uh, but what we're going to do is we're going to derive standards that work according to Christianity, which is a bonus that they're true. Christianity, he says, will be explicitly preferred in part because on average, Christian beliefs lead to the best outcomes for the state and society. 
For example, teachers in any state-supported lower school or high school will be required to be practicing Christians, just as now they are effectively required to be practitioners of Globo Homo. And Christians will, all else being equal, receive state preferment, as well as, no doubt, preferment in the private sphere from jobs to social status. There's your social credit system again. Now, remember that story where Mao got power in 1949 and in 1950, the first thing he did was he purged the schools of everybody who wasn't on his program. Then he got power again in 1966, and the first thing he did was he purged the schools of everybody who was not on his program. Oh, Teachers in any state-supported lower school or high school will be required to be practicing Christians, just as now they are effectively required to be practitioners of Globo Homo. That's what he said. That's what he wrote. That's how he wrote it. And Christians will get preferment in under the state, but also in the private sphere from jobs to social status. Personal advancement in the state and society would thus certainly benefit from conversion to Christianity. Because there will be a social credit system that favors Christians, so you can get Christians to buy in on it. It might be objected that the result will often be Christians in name only, but that's fine. See, he doesn't care if people are faking that they're Christian, because probably most of the people in the fucking Christian nationalist movement are faking that they're Christian in the first place. They don't act like Christians. In fact, they're such a terrible witness for Christianity that it's an abomination. It's almost unbelievable how big of a turnoff to Christianity they are. Um, But that's okay. He says this, it explicitly says it might be objected that the result will of, a, of an incentive structure to pretend you're a Christian will often be Christians in name only, but that's fine. The goal is to weld together a society and most of all a ruling class. And while there will always be variability of belief over time, a strongly dominant religion will do the welding and that welding will lead to an increase in devout belief in a virtuous circle. Somehow the megalomaniac has no concept of megalomaniacs. The self-admitted one has no concept of the fact that people who are good at pretending to do a thing to strive and climb through a system will in fact do that and then close the door or kick down the ladders behind them. As a matter of fact, what he's setting up, if he's not going to be the tyrant of this system, is a straight path to pretending to be a good Christian to climb to the top of the ladder and then kick the ladder down behind anybody else and create a true not virtuous circle, a true totalitarian system. Of course, this is, you can already tell listening to this, none of this is going to get implemented. Everybody who hears this is going to have the exact same reaction you've probably had so far, which is, holy shit, this guy's crazy, which means it's a program designed to lure people into something that is designed to lose, which you got to wonder why somebody would be dumping that much money into it. He says, but the foundationalist state is not a policer of the practice of belief. Rather, it will encourage and incentivize moral behavior. See, policing 4.0 in the World Economic Forum New World Order program also doesn't really want to be policing at all. It's not going to police belief. It's just going to create a social credit system that incentivizes the hell out of it and disincentivizes not doing it. It will encourage and incentivize moral behavior with punishments when necessary, not of disbelief, but of actions that corrupt virtue. And I add yet again, in their own eyes, of course. Thus, it will forbid most divorce, not because it is a sin, but because it destroys society. It will frown on adultery and homosexual acts and disincentivize both, but not criminalize either. Hmm. It will punish graft, theft, and sharp practice. The unfettered free market will no longer be thought of as some special good or moral in itself. Gambling will be mostly illegal. There will be no lotteries. The state will corral and curb prostitution. It will flog pornographers, and it will execute abortionists and other murderers, and so forth in organic development that will depend on what can be accomplished at any given point while maintaining a proper balance of costs and benefits. So right there, by the way, is in four words, four words, Proof positive that this thing is just going to, if it were to get any amount of significant attention and grow, that it will sink itself with a gigantic outcry of the public. And the left will turn this thing into all the hay that it needs to take lots and lots and lots of power. It will execute abortionists, if you wondered which words I meant. At the same time, freedom of religious exercise for all will be allowed to the extent not actually in contradiction with virtue. Thus, any non-pernicious religion, as they define it, 
any religion that is not a proxy or bridgehead of external enemies of state or society will be permitted freedom of worship without any attempt to make worship difficult, such as Islam has always imposed on Christianity in the lands it has temporarily conquered. Paganism and polytheism will be allowed, and even preferred to the extent that virtue is their focus. So paganism is okay in his Christian nation because it's about virtue. Okie dokie. Well, one might make the argument that the super elite strata of society who run these secret societies are, in fact, at the bottom underneath everything, actually pagans. Nice little carve out there. Interesting. Naturally, wholly pernicious belief systems such as Satanism will be directly suppressed. Open atheism will be strongly discouraged and socially anathema. Of course, it's not explained how any of that will happen. Isn't this sounding like a great program? The tenth pillar, high culture. A superior society cannot exist without an excellent high culture. High culture strengthens the moral fiber of the ruling class. It also has a crucial political role in binding all levels of society together. Sounds like Theodore Adorno, frankly. The goal of art under foundationalism will be a form of emotional resonance where all sectors and levels of society feel they have something in common that ties them together and which impels them to virtue. So like the postmodern rights version of socialist hyper-realism or socialist realism. Okay. In foundationalism, art will not be a set of rigid beliefs, an aesthetic canon for the elite, as the as is the, quote, art of modernism. It will instead, like governance, be an organic new thing based on the wisdom of the past, intertwined with all the people high and low. True. An excessive attachment to high culture can lead to exaltation of luxury and thence to decadence, but that is a management problem. No society can long exist, much less be a strong society, without a unifying component of the spiritual in a broader sense than simply religious that offers the society a heroic narrative. So the worker is toil and toil is heroic was the socialist realism version of that. High art of all types, in particular architecture, something to be seen and honored by all, provides that unifying component. I told you they're going to be wanting to build these cool buildings The upper orders will be expected to exuberantly patronize high art. Okay. Keeping in mind Aristotle's thoughts on magnanimity. Okay, so the upper orders of society will be expected to exuberantly patronize high art. But who gets to decide what's high art? Well, it's going to be consistent with foundationalism and its view of virtue and probably whatever components of aesthetics fall from that. Artists, he says, will work in cooperation with the pillars of society, state and private, rather than being destructive agents of the left, as they mostly have been for the past century. Hi. So the art is all going to be propaganda for the system. It will never a- ever be subversive or um, something that challenges that which exists and is trying to exist forever. High architecture in particular... That of grant, so art will not be true. Art will support the system, right? Art will not be able to express truths that fall outside of the system. That's what the big point of that peri- previous paragraph was. Art will not be able to express truth outside of the system, which is not truth. This is the same inversion that Hegel did that put for Nomft, but in this case, it's foundationalism over for Stand, which is understanding. High architecture, he says, in particular, that of grand buildings, is a bridge between God and man. It sounds like a tower of uh, Genesis chapter, what is it, 16? And a sinew binding state and people, the ruling class and the masses. Low architecture, that of daily living and daily use, is key to satisfaction in the life of a populace. Thus, a coherent and uplifting architecture, high and low, is and always has been necessary for any successful society. It is frozen music. Design great architecture and you build a key component in binding a society together through its role in offering a common art through and a, uh, sorry, and through that a common culture. Art and architecture will be classical in the sense that classical traditions and that classical traditions can express any meaning desired in a variety of languages and offer beauty and continuity along with enough originality to prevent seeming calcified. Foundationalism has no need to create anything that is new, 
though some organically developing novelty is to be expected. So no new art, just repeated classic styles that uphold the virtue system that's already in place. Eleventh pillar, techno-optimism. All right, there we go, okay. Foundationalism does not idolize agrarianism. The rural life and culture has its place, and nature and its forms influence good architecture. But high culture and the drive to create a successful society always revolves around cities and therefore technology. Let me be fair to Haywood and say that when he talked with Tucker, he talked about farming and beekeeping and you know small animal husbandry, well, in particular uh, chickens uh, that he does, and vegetable gardening. Um, so... He does have some connection to the land, and he did encourage people to do that, which I also agree with that, by the way, that it's a a good way to ground back into the real, which is actually his first piece of advice for young people is to ground back into the real. And he offers as an example of a way to do it, which is a, I think, shining moment, actually, of his interview with Tucker Carlson. Um, He's particularly, I think, eloquent in describing beekeeping and how nice it is until he gets weird about the idea that they use bees and they truck them to California where they grow almonds, and he doesn't like that. And almonds, I guess, should be expensive or something. Foundationalism, he says, strives to offer a goal for an outlet, for an inspiration, for human aspiration. And rural life cannot build spaceports, aside from today not occupying the daily life of any significant percentage of the population. Technological striving will be demanded and therefore honored. At the same time, foundationalism rejects the delusional belief in technology as deus ex machina, the God and the machine that's going to save us from everything. The singularity, he says, will never arrive, nor will strong artificial intelligence. Such ideas are distractions, eschatological fantasies that harm human flourishing. So um, we're going to have techno-optimism. Technology is going to move us forward, but we're not going to get into this idea that technology is going to save us from all of our problems. A possible objection, he says, is that technology is inherently anti-human, tending to atomize society and family, destroying the unchosen bonds and intermediary institutions that bind any competent society. This is accurate up to a point, but the answer is not to pretend that we can all live in the Shire or achieve a stable post-technological society. The answer is to make man the master of technology, not technology the master of man. I don't disagree with Haywood in this part, by the way. And to depreciate technology that delivers autonomic individualism. I think we should be doing some thinking about that, how we depreciate it. I don't want to use his methods for sure. We choose atomization. It is not forced on us. I agree with that. And that's why I don't think that their claim that liberalism atomizes is true. When technology appeals to the worst angels of our nature... uh, societal strictures are the solution, not pretending we can return the genie to the bottle. I think he's actually a little bit realistic there. He cites uh, The War on Normal People by Andrew Yang here, among others. Um, Enlightenment Now by Steven Pinker. Uh, Apocalypse Never by Michael Schellenberger, which I do recommend as that, um, among others. The twelfth pillar, I don't want to keep dragging this out, nationalism, not globalism. Foundationalism is a system for the West. It is unlikely to work as well for any other society, although certainly elements of it could benefit all civilizations. Its specific focus is America, and this is really important, listen to this. Its specific focus is America or the lands where America now is, give or take. In other words, he's not particularly committed to America or the American nation or the American project, or we can assume the American constitution. It's not what he's interested in. Saving the nation is not something these people are interested in. It's already That's already a ship that sailed. They don't care. Talk about the Constitution around these people on Twitter. See what happens. They'll tell you immediately it's a failed doctrine, failed document. They'll tell you immediately they'll quote Lysander Spooner to you and say, as Andrew Torber recently did just like two days ago as of this recording on Twitter, that either the Constitution cannot... Uh, Either the Constitution produced the the societal order that we have or was unable to prevent it. In either case, it is useless. That is their view of the Constitution. And so its specific focus is America, and then he qualifies, or the lands where America now is give or take. That's what he's actually interested in. America? Yeah, maybe. That's his attitude toward our country. That's American civic renewal is the name of his fucking secret society. Eh, America. Or the lands where America now is, give or take. 
Within that area, he says, foundationalism will be the spine of the nation, and that nation will stand apart from other nations. Which nation? The new foundationalist nation, not America, which will be on the lands where America now is, give or take. So foundationalism will be the spine of the nation, not the constitution, foundationalism. And that nation will stand apart from other nations with no interests in other nations beyond trade and useful articles and a decent mutual respect for each other's interests, combined with the willingness to defend those interests if threatened. That sounds very realistic. Immigration will only be permitted in extremely limited amounts and only of culturally compatible individuals with specific worthwhile skills. All illegal immigrants and legal immigrants of the past several decades, not culturally compatible, will be deported to their countries of origin. But it won't be a police state. In foreign policy, I actually think we do need to do a lot to get rid of the illegal aliens on our soil. So I don't disagree with that in necessarily uh, aims, but I'm sure that the means are going to be questionable under foundationalism. In foreign policy, the only relevant criterion will be the ends of the nation. Although since foundationalism will explicitly prefer Christianity, the interests of Christians as Christians outside the country, and to some extent also Jews, yeah, there's a little bone for you Jews, will be considered an interest of the nation. The foundationalist state will implement an aggressive industrial policy tailored to benefit the populace, meaning workers, not a parasitic elite. Uh, so there's no communism in there at all. Hmm. In short, globalism and its current meaning will be despised and treated with contempt. Dual citizenship will not be permitted. Any citizen who views himself as a global citizen, not a citizen of the nation, will be made to leave while his assets stay behind. I'm fine with kicking out the global citizen idea or pressuring them in some way like that, but not necessarily seizing their assets. The path. How is foundationalism to be accomplished, he says, he says, and we're getting to the end. Not easily, easily, not, and here, let me start that again, because I'm not going to stutter a, a single word on this. How is foundationalism to be accomplished? Not easily, and not without the world first being broken and then remade. We come back to postmodern, uh, or to right-wing postmodernism, which is about shattering and, what did we call it, um, refactored subsidiarity. The first requirement is smashing and ir irretrievably discrediting our, our current system. So when I tried to remember the wording earlier, I have read this twice before this, by the way. Uh, when I tried to remember the wording earlier, he didn't say smash. He said break or broken or whatever. But here he says smash. The first requirement is smashing and irretrievably discrediting our current system. That is the cultural and political dominance of the left, the poison of the modern age which he still doesn't even know is, is A, not liberal, and is B, progressive, and is C, a romantic reaction to the Enlightenment, and therefore D, not the Enlightenment. He doesn't even know that, but we're going to smash what there is and ir irretrievably discredit the existing system, which isn't even the thing that he thinks it is. This, when done, will destroy forever the philosophical dominance of autonomic individualism. When that is successfully accomplished, the ground will be cleared. If we're getting rid of individualism, now autonomic individualism, he's playing that same game, law unto oneself. But if he's getting rid of individualism, what's left? Some form of collectivism. So we're going to have probably subsidiarity style collectivism. In other words, we're going to have lots of balkanized little regions throughout the country that have their own doctrinal and civic beliefs, and you're encouraged to move to the one that fits you best, which is exactly what they advocate for in all of their programs. But a broken nation is an easier nation to control. A sentence that I said in May that made the Christian nationalists on Twitter in this crowd very upset was that the whole United States, I don't remember the exact wording, all 50 states bound together, healthily defending the Constitution is in the Bill and Bill of Rights is actually as fully amended is the best bulwark against communism and all tyranny that man has ever devised. They got very upset that I said that the proper the, the Constitution fully and properly defended is that bulwark against tyranny because they don't want the Constitution in their way either. That's part of the poison of the modern age that has to be smashed and irretri irretrievably discredited because it's the poison of the modern age. And so 
This, when done, he says, will destroy forever the philosophical dominance of autonomic individualism, which is all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, among them life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, a.k.a. property. When that is successfully accomplished, he says, the ground will be cleared for foundationalism. See, we're going to smash everything and bring in a new system that's his. How about that? If that is not successfully accomplished, there is no point in talking about a worthwhile future for human flourishing. See, liberty, not possible to give you human flourishing. Might as well just hang it up. It's my way or the highway, guys. The future will instead be a sickly random walk into the distant future and perhaps no future at all if man extinguishes himself. This sounds a little bit like Marcuse right there. Achieving foundationalism will inevitably occur in part by first passing through chaos and violence. Okay, so we can assume that there's some kind of a, they would call it a counter-revolutionary uh, movement, but it's a, it's a revolutionary movement. Through the chaos, there will be steps forward and steps backward, but if our leaders are bold men informed by foundationalism, more steps will be made forward than backward. But if foundationalism is truly a system based in reality, it will succeed in its goals. Success breeds success, resulting in that public opinion will, to the extent not already turned to foundationalism, decisively turn in that direction. While foundationalism, or if that doesn't work, they got a social credit system for you. While foundationalism does not take its direction from public opinion, it realizes that a society must, to large extent, reflect public opinion. So there's one of those, it doesn't do this, but it does this. And that in a modern technological society, opinions will always be widely and quickly formed. The system, therefore, while led from above, must also organically grow, sorry, must also grow organically from below. As above, so below. As below, so above. The Ouroboros kind of does show up here with the people seeing it kind of in the mark. The system, therefore, while led from above, must also grow organically from below and become a living thing, strong and flexible, to face the future with confidence, audacity, and determination. Then he quotes the Mandalorian and says, this is the way. So, while led from above, must also grow organically from below and become a living thing, strong and flexible. The World Economic Forum word for that is resilient. Um, so... That is the Foundationalist Manifesto, The Politics of Future Past, written by Charles Haywood on June 17th, 2021. That is the basis for his program at The Worthy, what is it called? The Worthy House that I forgot already what it's called. Um, yeah, The Worthy House. And uh, also, presumably, because it shows up so clearly in his uh, Society for uh, American civic renewal, which seems to be, well, it doesn't seem to be, it literally is a secret society or semi-secret society, a society for American civic renewal, which has a vision and a mark, which is an inverted cross, which is a little odd. And, um, the promises to be operated through a superstructure that currently has lodges with members that are um, either Christian nationalist or Christian nationalist adjacent, led by, for example, Nate Fisher in um, Dallas, Texas, uh, Haywood himself in Indianapolis, Indiana, question mark in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, and maybe Doug Wilson, question mark in Moscow, Idaho, which are kind of strongholds other than Indianapolis of the Christian nationalist movement as it is. Um, I remind you that Nate Fisher worked with Matt Peterson and Joshua Abitoy, who are, who's the business guy, uh, Byzantine business guy, uh, like Yeats's golden bird and, um, which refers to Byzantium and, uh, that they three worked together to form, the American Reformer and New Founding, also the pro programs that were picked up recently by The Blaze, which includes hiring Peterson as editor-in-chief, and um, what, what what's going on here. So this is your Christian nationalist movement as far as it's actually making bold advances in society, uh, and it seems to be based on a cultic secret society led by a self-confessed, although maybe he's joking about himself, uh, apocalyptic megalomaniac named Charles Haywood, who is a shampoo magnet, who is richer than avarice in his own words, uh, who seems to be able to bankroll this entire option. Um, hearkening us back to what I mentioned earlier about a podcast with one Nate Fisher, and I believe Joshua Abitoy talking to Aaron Wren, where they were talking about 
their agenda and their program, and in which they explicitly said that there would be incentives uh, created to get especially ministry and church organizations on board with their program, which I know at least sometimes secondhand uh, have definitely been the case. Um, People talk. And so I bring us back after that heart... heartening read of The Politics of Future Past by Charles Haywood. I bring us back to our our kind of original opening question. What the fuck is Christian nationalism? We can kind of see how it's moving. And like, I don't know where, where William Wolf fits into this. I don't know for sure where Stephen Wolf fits into this, but I know that William is marching in social media in fair amount of lockstep with these guys that they defend one another. I know that I had never heard of Charles Haywood in my life, and then he attacked me out of nowhere on a Monday morning on social media with a peculiar attack, not strange or weird, but peculiar. It had a unique quality and character that was echoed by Stephen Wolf within an hour or two, and then amplified into kind of reflexive frenzy around their social media echo chambers, which it all makes sense how they might communicate if we think that there might be a network of secret society lodges where they're all sharing information, strategies, plans, and a single vision that they're bound under a single mark to perpetuate. And it just seems particularly odd. So I had stumbled into this point thinking that Christian nationalism was a fairly obvious trap being set up by our federal government, um, that players on the right, either in naivety or because there are feds that have infiltrated conservative Christianity or are pushing it, or some of both, uh, or much of both, actually, or maybe just because they got their... Uh, their um, druthers up and they got all worked up and they started to, as a friend of mine said, pound their chests a little. We're going to do something. We're going to have a Christian nation. They started pounding their chests like like silverbacks or something like this. Maybe some combination of these three things. I figured they're just stumbling or walking or being led into or some combination of that uh, in running face first, diving face first into this obvious trap being set for them for the federal by the federal government that's designed to nullify independent Christianity and get us trapped on uh, convention Christianity or, or you know centrally controlled Christianity uh, through a variety of mechanisms I don't have to describe. And now I have to wonder what it, I couldn't quite figure out why it was so overwhelmingly coordinated. I knew it was kind of cultic, but now there's like this secret society aspect and this really weird manifesto with a really weird thing. And at first I was very skeptical of the ties to this, you know, American civic renewal society thing. And I started to look and I was like, oh, wow, it was incorporated by Haywood. It incorporates exactly the same principles as Haywood's manifesto. We can easily guess that Haywood is paying the bills and cutting a lot of the checks or at least the investments being made into this. And that uh, then the people that I most strongly associate with this bad behavior online, especially in the corporate sense, are members or in fact presidents in the case of Nate Fisher of the lodges of the secret society. And all of a sudden it doesn't feel nearly so organic. And then their, their entry is to take over into the media apparatus of the blaze, which, um, Glenn Beck used to run, but now it's run by, uh, What's his name? It goes by Tyler Carditis on on Twitter. Tyler something or another. I don't remember. Cardone or something like this. I've met him too. Um, That becomes a lot more interesting and concerning. Of course, the, the political philosophy of Carl Schmitt is identifiable and felt, but lots of overlaps probably for similar reasons, that tyranny is always tyranny, with things that we've read from, not that I think that they got their inspiration from Mao or their inspiration from Marcuse or even Adorno, but the same flavors are cropping up um, as these other megalomaniacal people who wanted to install kind of more decentralized secret society tyrannies. Um, So I'm stuck now. I was at the point where I thought I had a pretty decent grasp on this kind of waste of time right-wing fuck-up called Christian nationalism, which is not at all the kind of soft, naive, cute thing like we want to have renewal of American Christian values and so on that people sometimes will portray it as, but rather something that at least appears to have 
more sinister undertones, which makes me ask the question, what the fuck is Christian nationalism? What the fuck is this movement really? What's going on here? And I'm not saying I'm going to answer this question. I don't know the answer to this question. I am left with more questions, but more importantly, much more unsettling questions after finding out all of this and taking the time to read this crap than I had when I started out. So if you're getting involved in the Christian national thing, if you think James Lindsay's attacking Christians, and that's what I'm about, maybe maybe you should slow down a little bit. I have no beef with Christians. I work with Christians regularly. I like Christians. I talk about very Christian things with Christians very frequently. I have a great relationship with a lot of Christians. I consider myself strongly culturally Christian. I refer to the Bible for both wisdom and for cultural touchstones all the time and do so well. I take it very seriously. Um, I have no demonstrable beef against Christians. You can look back to my new atheist days 10 years ago and find some, but we grow up. And yet I get accused of attacking Christians, largely fueled by this rampant movement that now has these weird ties to this weird cultic manifesto and secret society built off of it that unfortunately can't be denied because the names are actually on the paper and the paper is publicly accessible and visible. And so I'm not at all sure what to think or do about this. But if you're getting involved in it, I think you should start asking a lot more questions and not just the practical ones I've recommended in the past. Some very cynical, some very prosaic questions like what the F is going on here? How significant is this movement? Why? Who is Carl Schmidt to you? Why is Carl Schmidt important? How is Carl Schmidt Christian in your mind? How is this an ethic of Christianity in your mind? I mean, there are so many questions that need to be asked. How much money is involved? What's that money being purposed to do? How is the guy who wrote this with so much money openly saying that he knows that money causes corruption and seeming to be exempting himself from that and kind of holding himself as a paragon of virtue? There's just ex- there's so many questions explode to mind once you start to realize that this is profoundly fishy. And I hate to do this because I consider Glenn Beck a friend of mine, uh, and I know that he's removed from operations at the Blaze, and it's not really his thing. It's that Tyler's thing. Um, but why is the Blaze acquiring assets that were developed under the auspices of exactly these same programs? In fact, why are they acquiring assets that just seem to have very little value, like a line and return. That's the other one. It's called return. They seem to have very little intrinsic value to them. Why are they hiring these bloggers and stuff to go on and become the new Schmidian gar- vanguard operating through that media apparatus? And what does that mean for the the ability for them to do what they've been doing at American Reformer, which is to launder Schmidian political philosophy and other um, kind of very reactionary concepts into the broader conservative movement. And what is the what will be the consequences of that, especially for Christians if they end up taking the bait, knowing, knowing that there is a gigantic Department of Justice hook inside that bait waiting for them. And why are the people involved in putting out that bait um, pretending that they're immune to or not aware of that hook? These are super important questions and everything just got so much more suspicious and fishy we've got to be asking 